over the luncheon adjournment, firstly in response to the question in relation to the submissions in, in the arbitration, um, my instructions are that we have no difficulty with the court being shown those. Um, I don't yet have a copy to hand up, and I should say that having only um, taken over conduct of this case relatively recently, I haven't seen the pleadings in, in the arbitration, but we will make copies available to the court in case it assists. Uh, secondly, uh, in response to the question raised about the headings, we have checked the original uh, 1924 Act, and if I could pass up copies of the 1924 Act um, as published in, in, in the statute for 14 and 15 George V. Um, uh, and just tell my lords that in the French text of the convention as signed, the headings did not appear, but in the text of the convention as scheduled to the English Act, the headings had been inserted, presumably by the draftsman of the English Act, and our research so far has not been able to cast any light on the question of why. So is, is the French text of any relevance to the construction of a, a convention scheduled to the English statute? My lord, the, the French text of the 1924 convention is, is the authentic text. So in terms of construing the convention as itself, it, it probably is relevant. Insofar as the rules applied by force of, well, not force of law, were given effect to by the 1924 Act, then one would have to look at the rules as scheduled, because the Act itself refu refers to the rules as set out in the schedule. Um, that's probably a distinction without any significant meaning on the facts of this case, because actually we're looking at the Hague Visby um, rules. But it, it, in, in terms of the, the English Act, what it does show in our submission, and I can't put it any higher than this, is that if the, is that the draftsman of the Act considered that Articles 3 and 4 uh, were setting out the um, rights, um, were, were setting out uh, the matters that were engaged um, by Article 2. So uh, uh, Article 2 uh, refers to, um, in, in, rela uh, in relation to loading, handling, stowage, carriage, custody, care, and discharge, that uh, the rights and obligations shall be subject to the responsibilities and liabilities and entitled to the rights and immunities set forth. Uh, and the English draftsman considered that Article 3 contained responsibilities and liabilities and Article 4 rights and immunities. Uh, and that does give um, some support in, in our submission, although I accept as a matter of international construction not much support, but some support to, to our submission that th this is a package of rights and obligations cre created by the rules intended to be engaged um, during the period referred to in Article 2, and by reference to the definitions clause, that period is beginning with loading and ending with discharge. Um, well, it sounds as if it would be a bit unfortunate if anything turned decisively on the headings. <laughs> um, there I, you go. I, I think it would uh, it indeed be unfortunate if, it, if anything turned decisively on the headings, my lord. Anyway, thank you very much for clarifying that. And, um, um, Right, well, we'll be interested to see the um, submissions on the basis that um, whatever we're shown is shown to us by agreement of the parties. In, in, in the, yep. I hope we can put a package together, perhaps overnight, and submit them to the okay, That's very helpful. Thank you. Can, can I ask you a related question? When construing the Hague Visby rules, which is what we're doing, I think, uh, do we start from construing the Hague rules and then see what changes are made? Do we start with the Bisbee rules as a fresh text? Or does it not make any difference? Uh, my, my Lord, uh, uh, under the, the Vienna Convention, uh, in, in as far as you're construing the Convention rather than the schedule to the English Act, uh, it, under the Vienna Convention, my, my understanding is the Court can look at what came before with, with a view to aiding its interpretation of, of the. Um, of the convention, and I, I, I just remind myself that the relevant provisions of the Vienna Convention are set out in the Lady M. We're, we're not construing an English Act, are we? Because the, the, the rules are incorporated by, by contract. The, by, by contract, indeed. Um, so we are construing the convention text. In, in, indeed. Um, uh, and it's Article um, 31 of the Convention. This appears at page 744 of the report in the Lady M, uh, paragraph 35. The Vienna Convention is headed General 
Article 31 is headed general rule of interpretation. A treaty shall be interpreted in good faith in accordance with the ordinary meaning to be given to the terms of the treaty in their context and in the light and object of its purpose. So the light and object of the purpose of the hague Visby rules is to amend the Hague rules, whose purpose, in turn, was to give rise to the, the package of uh, rights and immunities that, that we've looked at. Uh, and then Article 32 uh, provides that um, supplementary means of interpretation, recourse may be had to supplementary means of interpretation, including preparatory works of the treaty, the circumstances of its conclusion, in order to confirm the meaning resulting from the application of Article 31, or to determine the meaning when the interpretation of Article uh, under Article 31 leads to a, uh, an ambiguous or, or obscure result, or a manifestly absurd and unreasonable result. So the, the purpose, again, of the hague Visby rules is to amend, in certain respects, the, um, the provisions of the Hague rules. Uh, in one sense, because the Vienna Convention doesn't apply retrospectively, I can't say that the Vienna Convention applies to the interpretation of the Hague rules, but it does apply uh, to the interpretation of the hague Visby rules. I think I read somewhere um, that uh, somebody said there's no such thing as the hague Visby rules. It's the Visby amendments to the to hague. hague rules. So, it, where does that come from? Can I you think that me? comes from Mr. Diamond's um, is it article, right? but certainly, I, I think, strictly speaking, there is no such thing as the Hague rules, even though we all refer to them as Hague Visby rules, even though we, we all refer to them as such, uh, uh, and even though the words of incorporation in this contract refer to them as such. Yes. I think we could take Hague Visby rules as a defined term for these purposes to mean the Hague rules as amended by the Visby process. Yes, but that, may, what, that point may be relevant to um, my Lord's question about what is it that we are construing. Um, and your answer that we're construing the Hague rules to amend the Hague rules. The Hague rules as amended by the Visby Protocol, and in particular context, does the word whatsoever widen in any way the time bar in Article 2? You, 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 you said the Vienna Convention was not retrospective. Mm -hmm. it, it appears from paragraph 33 of the Lady End, although it was ratified by the United Kingdom in 1975. Didn't come into force until 1980, presumably because it had to wait until a number of signatory states reached a, a minimum. Um, does that mean it, it doesn't actually apply? I mean, um, my, my Lord, it's certainly treated in the Lady M as, it, as relevant. It, it's treated in the, the Lady M as, as relevant, and it's treated in the, the Ocean Victory, the case cited here, as being relevant in relation to the 1976 Convention on Limitation. Um, I, I confess I had overlooked um, that, that, that timing point, but it potentially means that it shouldn't have been referred to in the, in the Lady M, but, but it was. And I don't think I can take the matter any further than that. Thank you. Probably my fault. Thank you. Uh, did my Lord have a... a I was at first instance in the Lady M. I, 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 I where it started that M. Uh, but I, I think my Lord had another point for Lord Justice Hong. No, I, well, I was going to make the perhaps slightly flippant remark, but uh, that uh, they're called the Hague Visby Rules, not the Visby Rules, but that they are an amendment to the Hague Rules. Indeed. Um, uh, and so, my lord, <coughs> before the adjournment, I had got uh, almost to the end of, of the English cases that we, we say uh, assist the court. And I'd like to deal very quickly, if I can, with the last of those cases, which is the decision of Mr. Justice Tomlinson in uh, Linear Nevera and Abnormal Load, which the court has a bundle, uh, the authorities bundle, tab 12, page 195. Um, and this case concerned an agreement between a, a plaintiff uh, barge owner and the defendant. They entered into a, an agreement for the carriage of two cranes uh, belonging to an Italian company in an agreement that incorporated the Hague rules by way of a, a general clause paramount. So we're in Hague rules territory. Um, during the voyage, one of the cranes collapsed and caused an ignition of propane gas, which damaged the barge, which is why the, the carrier in that case was the claimant. Uh, uh, and, and the party counterpart to the contract of carriage um, brought a counterclaim for damages uh, relating to, and I use the word relating to in the widest possible sense, uh, uh, events that had occurred at loading. So th there is a uh, counterclaim alleging uh, that the defendant suffered loss because the barge was unseaworthy when she presented for loading in Venezuela, meaning that repairs had to be carried out and that this delayed the start of loading and caused loss 
because expensive lifting equipment and personnel were idle while the repairs were carried out. Uh, the claimants submitted that the counterclaim was barred under Article 3, Rule 6, uh, and the defendants argued that there was no sufficient connection between the claim they were advancing for financial loss um, for the uh, equipment and personnel kept idle and the goods, and that therefore Article 3, Rule 6 was not engaged. Uh, they argued that the claim could have arisen even if the goods had never been loaded, which has echoes of the point in the Oxonia. Uh, Mr Justice Tomlinson held that the rules applied um, Article 3, Rule 6 applied if the claim related to the goods which were shipped or intended to be shipped. And we see that from the headnote um, at, at paragraph 196. Um, held the claim fell within Article 3, Rule 6 if the loss in respect of which the claim was brought related to goods which were either shipped or intended to be shipped. And then just turn, turning to the decision itself, um, first of all, that general description in the headnote um, undermines in our submission any suggestion that the decision is inconsistent with our interpretation of the rules. Um, it, it does not support the contention that the time bar applies um, pre-loading. In, in fact, in our submission, the decision, when we look at the detail, shows that our approach is correct. Um, and that's for a number of reasons. Firstly, we see from the judge's analysis um, at page 198, um, paragraph 10, that it's um, important um, that the um, alleged wrongful act was the failure to make uh, the vessel seaworthy, which is a, a breach of the Article 3, Rule 1 obligation. So it's accepted that if there, there existed a contractual relationship between the claimants and defendants, pursuant to which the defendants can pursue the allegation, uh, it, indeed the breach alleged is one of the obligations contained, is of the obligation contained in Article 3, Rule 1, which provides the carrier shall be bound before and at the beginning of the voyage to exercise due diligence to make the vessel seaworthy. Insofar as that goes, that engages the point my Lord, Lord Justice Nugent mentioned to me uh, this morning, but that may well predate um, the loading. But the decision goes on to look at the significance of the fact that the, the, the connection between the loading, sorry, the breach and the loading obligation means that the breach is related to uh, performance of the loading obligation. So if we look at paragraph 17 um, of the judgment, um, or well, actually, in this case, loading had started. And that was going to be my third point, my lord. I I irrespective of whether loading had started, the breach of the seaworthiness obligation related to loading to mean that the claim was engaged. But on the facts of this case, loading had started. So, my lord, that, that, that's the, the second um, and third point I was going to come on to make. So, firstly, at paragraph 70, Mr Justice Tomlinson concluded that there was um, a, a sufficient relationship so that's looking at the words in relation to in Article 2. Uh, I do not find the question entirely easy to resolve. In the end, I've concluded that the claim does have a sufficiently close association with the cargo intended to be an in fact carried to render it subject to Article 3, Rule 6. The critical feature of the claim was, uh, of the claim which has in the end proved to me the decisive, is that it relates to, as the defendants put it, expensive lifting equipment and personnel which were present, as I infer especially for the specialist loading of the cargo, um, and essentially was saying that the claim is arises because the cost of loading was increased as a result of the breach. So we've got breach of an obligation that relates to the loading during the period of loading and affects the cost of loading. And, and so it, in our submission, that case properly analysed it, it is consistent with and certainly not it, it, in any way contrary to the interpretation of the rules um, uh, uh, and so, in summary of, of the English law uh, position, the period uh, of responsibility, as, uh, uh, as Mr. Foxton put it in the Alani, covers the period we would submit, starting with when the carrier starts doing something that relates to loading, and ends when he stops doing anything that relates to discharge. Within that period, the whole of the package of rights and immunities in Article 3 and 4 apply. Outside that period, none of the package of rights and liabilities in Article 3 and 4 apply. And if we are right on that as the proper construction of the rules, then incorporating the rules into your contract can't widen the scope of the application of the rules. So if you have a bill of lading contract that covers the period before loading, and after discharge, which you incorporate into it 
rules that only apply from loading to discharge, then that incorporation, by definition we submit, can only relate to that period. If the rules only relate to that period, incorporating them only affects that period. Um, uh, uh, and so I'm, I'm going to move on very quickly, if I may, third point in my route map, to look at the cases from other jurisdictions. Because we submit... Just before you do that, that last point you've made, it must depend upon the terms of incorporation, because you could expressly say the Hague rules, or the Hague visiting rules, apply to the period post-discharge. As if, because the Article 7 allows you to say that. In, 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 indeed, you could, uh, my Lord, or you could expressly have an equivalent of Article 3, Rule 6, um, as was in um, the New York Star, in New York Star and uh, apply that to, to the whole period. But if you simply incorporate, um, and the words, perhaps in that respect, I ought to go back to the Charter Party and show, show my Lord. Just say it's subject to the Hague Visby Rules. It, 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 indeed, and so um, the, the wording of the corporation says this charter party shall have effect subject to the Hague Visby rules. And so, your point is that itself doesn't extend it beyond the, the Article Seven. Pre precisely, the Article Seven period. It, 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 the Article One Stroke Two Stroke Seven period, the, the period of responsibility, as I've, I've been calling it. If you say subject to, it means subject to the rules as they stand. And that wording of incorporation in clause 1310 of the Charter Party, which is the clause which brings the rules into operation for the purposes of, of the Bill of Lading, does not evidence any intention on the part of the parties that those rules that in and of themselves don't apply outside the period of responsibility will apply outside that period <coughs> of this contract. You said the period of responsibility was the phrase used by Mr. Fox. Mr. Justice Wright used it. Right that in the 1920. I, I, I think I, I'm sure my lord is right. Um, I, I, I wondered if it, if it required any sort of data from any higher court or, or anything. M my lord, only uh, in so far as um, Lord Justice Longmore used the words <coughs> of his accepted doctrine in, in the MSC um, Amsterdam to, to refer to the same concept. Is, is Mr. Justice Wright's case the same Ghost Millard that went higher up, or is it a different it, case? It, no, the same one that went higher up, but nothing contrary. Yeah, again, on different points. Uh, yeah, on different points, my lord. So no, nothing contrary to, to, to the dicta in the, the first instance of the two. Okay. And, uh, and hence, again, referred to by Lord yeah. Justice Normal. Uh, and so, my lord, the, the authorities from other jurisdictions, just to, to be quick, as we say, um, and the, the judge said, indeed, at paragraph 45 of his judgment, uh, these are important because it's settled law when considering an international convention, such as the Hague or Hague-Bisbee rules, that there should be a uniform interpretation by courts in different jurisdictions, particularly if there's shown to be a consensus amongst national courts. Uh, and we submit that there is such a consensus. And I'm just going to take my lords very briefly uh, to the cases um, with a short introduction. And the short introduction is this. I think the learned friends accept that the preponderance of the cases in other jurisdictions supports our construction. Uh, what they say is, firstly, they're mainly Hague rules cases, and I accept that. Uh, but I say, as my lords know, that the only difference of materiality is whatsoever, and that simply disposes of the issue one in your sonia. Uh, secondly, my learned friends say, in their skeleton argument, well, all, all of these decisions um, found themselves, at least in part, on, on the assumption that the rules only apply, that the time bar in the rules only apply to breaches of the rules. So the point uh, that, that Mr. Foxton decided to the contrary and the Alani, and the point which we don't have permission to appeal and therefore I, I can't advance before, before my lords. So it, it is correct, if I say this at the outset, then the court will see where I'm going. It is correct that in a number of the decisions I'm going to refer my lords to, uh, the various judges um, who came to a conclusion that we say support our interpretation, some of them did proceed on the basis that the Article 3, Rule 6 time bar was only engaged in relation to breach of an Article 3 obligation. Um, as a matter of English law, that assumption is incorrect. But our submission is essentially that all of the cases adopted other reasoning as well, which is still um, a, a proper grounding for finding that there is a consensus. 
And essentially, I'm going to be making that, that same point in, in relation to each of the cases I, I think my lords do. Uh, and the first, uh, uh, tab three of the bundle of authorities, is uh, the Malaysian Federal Court in Rambler Cyclocone P&O Stamp uh, Navigation. Uh, uh, and this is a, a case that factually is precisely on point because there was misdelivery after discharge from the vessel. Um, and the, the defendants in, in this case claimed the benefit of Article 3, Rule 6. And at first instance, the judge concluded that Article 3, Rule 6 was an exception clause and that because the defendants were in breach um, of, of a fundamental duty, they were not entitled to rely on it. That, that point uh, was overturned in, in the Court of Appeal. Uh, but in the Court of Appeal, uh, Sir James Thompson, the Lord President, analysed the rules um, at pages 44 to 45, uh, uh, and I don't need to take my lords through that other, other than to, to refer to it, um, uh, and reached the conclusion that I accept is not open to me in this case, that is to say the conclusion that the rules don't, time bar doesn't apply uh, where the breach is of uh, an obligation not arising under the rules. Um, uh, but he also went on... Uh, uh, page 44, um, to deal with the point that does arise uh, in uh, our case. Um, and uh, so starting at the top of page 47 of the report, page 44 of the bundle, approach clearly is a matter of construction. All this leads to the conclusion the Act has no relation to anything that happens to the goods after they are discharged from the ship in which they have been carried. So there is a clear finding that as a matter of construction of the rules, they don't apply after uh, the cargo has been discharged. Uh, uh, and uh, the Lord President went on to refer to the analysis in Kyrene and Scindia, which I, I've taken my lords to, and to refer to the analysis in Goss Millard that I took my lords to, uh, uh, and is therefore, in our submission, adopting, uh, uh, as well as the point that's not open to me, uh, adopting the point that I do make. Uh, and if this uh, analysis I I is correct, this is strong support for our interpretation of the rules. Uh, Lord, uh, the, the Lord President did not, um, uh, as part of his analysis, however, refer to Article 2, which, as the Court is aware, we put um, some weight on. Uh, uh, Chief Justice, we, however, did um, refer to Article 2, which we see from page 46. Um, and he says, I've had bottom of the right-hand column, I've had the opportunity of reading judgment of the Lord President, I agree with the conclusions he's arrived at. The Hague rules as a matter of construction cease to apply after the goods are discharged from the ship. However, having reached the same conclusion on the agreed facts and circumstances uh, of, <coughs> of this case, because of the view I take of Article 2, and he says, because I've taken a slightly different view, I'll set out my reasons, and he then refers to um, Article 2, um, and um, then again refers to Pyron and Scindia over the page. Uh, and the conclusion is in the top right hand side of page 47 uh, where the Chief Justice says uh, this was a simple and clear case where the loss arose in relation to goods to the delivery of such goods can it be plausibly suggested that though the loss was due to the goods being delivered by the carrier to a party other than the shipper after the goods had been discharged from the ship they'd been placed in storage on the go down and the next duty was the carrier under the bill of lading was to deliver the goods to the shipper it was nonetheless a loss which arose in relation to the discharge of such goods so that's the emphasis on Article 2. And he says, I think not. Uh, and then significantly, I, re I referred to this this morning, the operation of discharge is different from the operation of delivery. If the intention and object of the Hague rules was also to provide for the responsibilities, liabilities, and rights and immunities of the carrier in relation to the delivery of the goods under the contract of carriage goods by sea, which the Hague rules apply, nothing would have been simpler than to insert the word delivery after discharge, or one could say in place of discharge. Um, and so that is precisely on point with our uh, analysis. Um, and the decision in that case uh, was then followed um, at tab 20. Sorry, was that the case that went to the Privy Council as well? I need to recall it's uh, I think, I think cited as the word. Say hi, Tom. Okay. Okay. I think there are, I think there may be two. Um, but this did involve say hi, Tom, didn't it? Yeah. Oh, did it? My Lord, I, I, I can check, or more correctly, Ms. Morton will no doubt check while I'm on my feet. But um, 
aside from that point, can I, can I then go to paragraph, uh, sorry, to tab 20 of the authorities bundle, where we see a subsequent decision, 2018, of the Court of Appeal um, in, in Malaysia, in a case called Min Metals and Nakoda Logistics. Uh, and again, this is a Hague Rules case. Uh, the plaintiff's case was Article 3, Rule 6, did not um, apply to non-delivery of the cargo. So that's the point not open to me because of the Alami uh, and indeed Captain Gregos. But it is also a point that concerned w whether the rules applied after discharge. And in, in that respect, um, uh, paragraph 39, uh, sorry, pages 396 to 397 in, in the bundle, Um, in the judgment um, uh, of, of Justice uh, Hathmanathan, uh, we see at paragraph 56, um, he relies on it in his reasoning, the decision in, in uh, PNO and uh, Rambler Cyclico, uh, a decision of the Malaysian uh, Federal Court. He, he then at paragraph 57 um, refers to a decision, uh, uh, another decision at first instance, in fact, a decision of his own decision at first instance following um, that case. At paragraph 58, he refers to the third edition of cars on bills of lading and points out at the top of page 399 that the term delivery in a bill of lading is ordinarily taken to refer to the transfer of possession to the consignee. It certainly does not mean the same thing as discharge. Uh, and then he uh, refers to the, the uh, judgment in Borealis that I took my lords to this morning. So um, what one sees from that it is the Rambler Cycler case being followed at first instance in Malaysia and in the Court of Appeal in, in Malaysia subsequently. And even though it forms part of the reasoning um, that the rules don't apply to non delivery at all, nonetheless, the timing point also forms part of the reasoning. Uh, and therefore, our submission is that the conclusion of the tribunal and the judge uh, necessarily involves concluding that those three decisions in the Malaysian courts are wrong. Uh, uh, and it also involves in our submission necessarily concluding that the decision um, of, of various Australian cases are wrong, and I'm taking the, the, the cases jurisdiction by jurisdiction rather than strictly chronologically. And that, the first is at tab 7, which is Tay's Brothers and ANL Cargo Operations. Uh, and, and if I can take my Lord's um, directly to um, the relevant passages, um, beginning at page um, 92 in the authorities bundle at, at line, just above line 15 to line 14, um, there's a reference to the incorporation of the rules. Uh, there's a reference to Pyron and Scindia <coughs> and to the Captain Gregos. And then um, just by the punch hole opposite li line about uh, 23, the time bar contained in Article 3, Rule 6 only applies to discharge the carrier from liability for which it becomes liable by virtue of the operation of the rules contained in, in Article 3, Rule 6 in, uh, uh, sorry, in Article 3 in respect of the risks contained in Article 2. So cited there the Captain Gregos, um, not a po point um, that is any longer valid as a point of English law because of the decision in, in the Alani, but then goes on to say the time bar has no application to any liability arising outside of those uh, parts of the contract of carriage for which the rules have no application. Um, and in our submission, that must, and in the context of this case, does mean that they end with the period of um, discharge from the ship. Um, <coughs> and indeed, if one goes back, and I should have started slightly earlier, where the rules, um, this is at line 13, where the rules contained in the schedules of the Commonwealth Act are incorporated in the contract of carriage, those rules only relate to so much the sea carriage which starts with the operation of loading and ends with the discharge of goods from the ship. So, so that is the key conclusion. Uh, and uh, Justice Cooper went on. Um, to say at, at page 298 of the judgment, 94 of my, my Lord's bundle, um, on the material before me, the damage to the frozen meat occurred between 5th of December and 26th of December, 
uh, and all of that was before loading, because in fact loading never took place in this case, uh, that the meat had defrosted and blood was seen coming out through the doors of the, of the container. The cargo was not loaded on board the vessel because blood was seen seeping through the seals. Uh, and, and then uh, Justice Cooper says, even taking the most liberal view of the term loaded on, where it appears in the definition of carriage of goods in uh, paragraph E of Article 1 to the schedule, the process of loading simply had not commenced, see Pyrene and Symbia. Further, an analysis of the statement of claim shows that the liability contended for is a liability which arose at a time anterior to the period covered by the operation of the rules. Uh, and that's anterior to any loading operation. So while the container was in the custody of the carrier, but not in any way related to loading. To the extent that this judgment relies on the Captain Gregos, is that to the first instance decision? It looks as if it might be. Yes, I think it may well be, which may account. Yes. Um, yes, yes. Mr. Rain is helpful. I was going to check the reference, but yes, it, it does appear to be so. Yep. Okay. Uh, I, and that would account, obviously, for, as it were, with respect, getting it wrong on that point. Yes. Um, but doesn't alter the force of the conclusion that the, the time bar does not apply preload. Um, my lords, the, the next um, Australian decision is, is in tab 10, Camel Export, um, a, a, a decision of the Court of Appeal, uh, oh, sorry, the Supreme Court of Appeal uh, of, of Victoria. Uh, this is again a question where the issue was defined, uh, we see at page 136, question whether the time bar clause in the rules applies to applying for loss of the goods after discharge from the ship, so materially identical to the same question. Uh, that, that my lords are considering, um, and uh, Mr. Justice Marks uh, considered this issue um, at page 13 and, uh, and following um, of the judgment, 148 um, of my lords bundle, um, and said um, at the bottom of page 148, the reach of rule 6 is a matter of construction of the rules and the contract between the parties. That's why I've used occasionally the, the expression reach of. Uh, uh, and um, the court then referred at page 149 to Lord Justice Bingham in the Captain Gregos, to T's brothers, to Goss Miller, Tyrene and Cindia. So all the same cases that I've taken my Lord to um, uh, uh, and express um, the following conclusion at the bottom of the page. The argument, in my opinion, is unsound. Clause 1 of the bill does no more than incorporate the Hague rules, which apply according to their terms only to the part of the contract between the parties. So that's the same point I was making to my lords earlier, that if you incorporate the rules by their terms, they only apply to part of the contract, then as incorporated, they only apply to part of the contract. And at the top of page 150, in my opinion, the time ball provided in Article 3, Rule 6 is inapplicable to the claim of the appellant in uh, the present case. Um, and the same conclusion is reached by the Supreme Court of New South Wales in... Um, have 11 um, of, of the bundle um, of, of authorities. In this case, um, the goods are damaged whilst they're being stored by the carrier um, after discharged. Uh, and, uh, Justice of Appeal Scheller uh, sets out at page 163 uh, the provisions of the Hague Rules uh, and then refers to Goss Millard, um, refers to what Lord Wright uh, said in that case, points out that he had been a, a pupil of uh, Scrutton when Scrutton was at the bar, uh, uh, and then deals with the bill of lading at page 164. Um, mm -hmm. and, and picking up at, at the bottom of page 164, goods in the custody of carrier before lading and after discharge, whether being forwarded to or from the ship, or whether awaiting shipment landed ashore or put into hulk or craft belonging to the carrier, uh, are in such custody, custody and sole risk of the merchant. So that's a, a, a clause limiting the, the period of, of responsibility. It then points out this does not relieve the carrier from liability for loss or damage to the goods arising from negligence or fault in the duties and obligations provided in Article 3. So the, the court is saying that that limitation doesn't apply if you're in breach of your Article 3 obligations. 
Um, and then put another way, the contract of carriage in Article 2 applies only insofar as the bill of lading relates to the carriage of goods by sea. Therefore, the second sentence of Clause 3 remains effective and applies after the goods have been discharged. So you've got a four square decision here that is looking at a, a, a clause that purports to restrict liability. It says that insofar as it's restricting liability in relation to the period covered by the rules, not valid, but insofar as it's restricting liability to the period not covered by the rules, um, that's valid. Uh, and the conclusion on the issue um, that um, was before that case um, was uh, set out at page 167. Uh, with the greatest respect, um, picking up at the bottom of the page, I disagree with his honest conclusion. In my operation, my opinion, the last operation for which the carrier was responsible by force of the Hague rules was the discharge of the goods from the ship. That operation was complete either when the goods crossed the ship's rails or when they were delivered to the ship's tackle, if the ship's tackle was used. From that moment, any operations undertaken were not subject to the Hague rules, and the obligations of the carrier in respect to them must be found elsewhere. Um, uh, and then at paragraph 168, in my opinion, the responsibilities placed on the carrier by application of the contract to the, um, um, to the contract of the Hague rules cease in circumstances of this case when the goods cross the ship's rails, uh, uh, finding there when discharge ends. And then the parties have agreed that subsequent to discharge from the ship, goods in the custody and care of the carrier should be at, at his sole, um, sole risk and responsibility of the merchant. Uh, and then at page 171, uh, there's a reference to, to the Tees brothers' uh, decision that I've already taken the court to. Uh, and at 173, um, the, the conclusion is, for these reasons, I, do, I, I agree with uh, Justice of Appeal Cole that the trial judge was right reject the contentions of the applicant based on the defence grounded on the time bar provisions. So uh, again, the, the time bar not applying to the operation after discharge. Um, the, the case Malone and Friend particularly relies on is um, the next one in, in Australia. Um, the next one is actually preceding that at tab 8. Um, the Xi Zhang Ku. Uh, 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 and this is the judgment in which um, President Kirby um, gave, I think Malone and Friend calls it a dissenting judgment. I'm not quite sure it, it, that's the right description. Um, th there was a contractual time bar in that case, and the majority of the Court of Appeal concluded that the nine-month contractual time bar was operative. Uh, and President Kirby concluded that it didn't matter whether it was the contractual time bar of nine months or the Hague Rules time bar of ten, uh, 12 months. Either way, the claim was time barred. Uh, I, I'm not at this stage um, going to go through um, the reasoning of, of the President because, because our submission is simply this. Insofar as he considered that the Hague Rules time bar applied uh, post-discharge, he was, for all the reasons I've given, wrong. But in the context of my present submission, it, it, insofar as the question arises whether there is a consensus under international law, his is the only voice um, contrary to the interpretation that we invite the court put on the Hague rules. And, and his one, whether one calls it dissent or over to judgment, uh, doesn't affect the consensus that appears from all of the other cases. Uh, next um, decisions th that no, I would... The, the international consensus on which you rely is confined to Malaysia and Australia um, and Hong uh, Kong and Hong Kong some two years. Uh, 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 and the, the Hong Kong cases um, at tab 16 a, a decision in the Court of Appeal in Hong Kong in Chong Yong Fai in China International Freight um, and again just taking this as, as quickly as I can at paragraph 2 um, uh, <coughs> Justice Repeal Chung referred to the, the passage in the Cap Captain Gregos uh, on, on appeal that I've already taken the court to um, uh, uh, and then um, the Court of Appeal went on to consider um, in, in the judgment of Justice Repeal uh, Gwen beginning at paragraph 4 the question of whether the time bar applied events um, after discharge uh, and this is a case uh, that involved 
carriage to Hamburg and then road carriage on to Moscow. Um, and the Court of Appeal concluded at paragraph 30 of, of, of its judgment. Uh, it, at page 278, in my view, the Hague Visby rules, so we are Hague Visby in this case, did not apply to the present claim, because where a contract of carriage involves both sea and inland transport, the Hague Visby rules apply only to that part of the contract of carriage that relates to sea transport, as shown clearly in the passages in the articles underlined in paragraph 26 of this judgment, uh, and paragraph 26 set out the, the provisions of articles 1, 2, and 3 that I've previously taken the court to. Now, I, I accept that in paragraph 30 of the judgment there's a reference to <coughs> other transport apart from sea transport, uh, but the, the logic of that approach applies to other activity apart from sea transport uh, and would therefore apply to storage after discharge just as much as it applied to post-discharge transport by some other means. Uh, and we see from paragraph 32 onwards an analysis of Hyrene and Symbia to Captain Gregos um, at first instance the Captain Gregos on appeal. At paragraph 46, a reference to uh, the Xi Jiang Fu, so the Australian case I've just taken, my lords, too. Um, and at paragraph 51, the heading, in my view, Article 3, Rule 6, could not possibly extend to wrongful delivery after inland carriage. And again, I, I accept that goes further in the sense it's been a, a supervening inland carriage, but if the rules uh, cease to apply after discharge, they cease to apply to any activity um, after discharge. And, and in this case, um, specifically, um, at paragraph 36, uh, the court concluded or accepted um, that the hague Visby rules could cover wrong delivery. So where, where my learned friend says a, a lot of the cases in other jurisdictions are, are based on point that is wrong as a matter of English law, i.e. the rules don't apply to misdelivery. This decision specifically says, well, they, they can apply to misdelivery, but they don't apply um, after discharge. Uh, uh, and this decision uh, has subsequently been followed. Uh, I, I don't think we need to look at it in any detail, but at first instance in Hong Kong at, at tab 21. So the consensus is, I accept, not a very wide consensus in the sense that I can only identify decisions in, in three jurisdictions. Um, nonetheless, um, subject to the decision of the President Kirby, um, it, it is a unanimous consensus, and, and we say, therefore, important to the court's consideration of the proper construction of the rules, particularly um, the Hong Kong cases that I've just taken my laws to that are hatelessly based and get the Alani point correct. Uh, there are no grounds on which they, they can be distinguished. Um, I'm going to deal very quickly, if I can, I'm conscious of the time, uh, with uh, the final points in, in my route map, because I've, I've covered a lot of it already in my submissions this morning by looking forward. The fourth point was the text map, textbooks, uh, and as we say in our skeleton, the, the majority of the textbooks are, are neutral. Some point one way, some point the other way, some raise the arguments and say, well, it might be this um, or it might be that. Um, the fourth edition of, of Carver, uh, which my lords have at tab 25 of the authorities bundle, um, at, at, at paragraph 9-130, does suggest that the Hague rules, um, bottom of page 484 of the bundle, where the Hague rules, as opposed to Hague Visby rules, as opposed to Hague rules apply, the time bar would seem to be operative in any case, because of the extreme breadth of its words. So that seems to suggest that the time bar applies post discharge. Um, the duty of cargo, uh, care to cargo, would usually exist under bailment uh, in any case. Um, uh, and then the, there's a footnote uh, at 459 uh, saying, in any event, see below. So the wording relied on as being the width of the wording is the words in any event, which actually are the same in the Hague or the Hague Visby rules, so they don't really justify the conclusion that the learned editors or authors have come to. Um, and, and the significance of that is that when we go to the fifth edition um, of Carver on uh, bills of lading, which my lords have at tab 24, 
that suggestion that the rules apply in any event, or at least the Hague Visby rules apply, does not appear in, in the equivalent paragraph. Um, so what was paragraph 9130 is now paragraph 9135. Um, and there's no longer any suggestion that the Hague Visby rules apply, that the Hague Visby rules time bar applies post discharge. Um, what we do see at the bottom of the page is a sentence beginning, but until such occurrence, it is arguable that under English law, the carrier shall hold the goods um, not only under the contract of carriage, but also under the rules. Uh, unless, again, it is, uh, as is perfectly permissible, he alters his responsibility uh, for this stage uh, by terms or terms in the contract of carriage or by special agreement. Um, as has already been stated, the main practical consequence of the extension or continuation of the contract of carriage is the application of package or unit limitation, the fire exception, and the time bars, and the prohibition reducing to reducing liability. So the editors there see, seem to be forming the view that the prohibition under Article 3, Rule 8 will apply. Um, and, and then that's where the, the missing words would have been. Uh, and then we carry on. The duty of care of cargo uh, would usually exist under bailment rooms in any case. It is submitted, therefore, that as a matter of English law contract, it may well be appropriate to state the position as being that the rules may apply as implied terms after receipt of the goods, but before loading and after discharge, uh, but during the period before delivery or up to the time or operation of any separate warehousing agreement, except insofar as this result has been excluded or modified. So that's the paragraph that supports the so-called Carver implied term. Uh, uh, and in our submission, it, it is significant that one would not need to imply a term to that effect if the rules themselves provided for, for that effect. And that therefore, uh, this passage in Carver, broadly, without the wording that was in, in, in the fourth edition, supports um, our interpretation of the rules. Well, doesn't paragraph 9, 126 deal with the position um, which we're concerned with? And they, um, the editors recognise the possibility time bar in Hague Visby may apply after discharge. It's all, it's all a bit tentative, but that's where they, that's where they make that point. My, my, my Lord, yes. So in, in one sense, this falls in the category of the books that I said refer to the, the, the possibility without really coming out to a, a firm conclusion. But the period may be referred to as the Hegel's period of responsibility we see at the top of page um, 478. Yes. Um, uh, 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 and then, um, as my Lord says, um, uh, at the bottom, an action for breach of this duty may argue <coughs> subject to the time bar, which are worded more widely. Uh, this has re recently been held to be so uh, uh, under the Hague rules, uh, and the note there is 543, uh, and the re reference to the alarming. But, but, but that, that, that is dealing with the question of whether a breach of the rules is covered by the time bar rather than whether a breach post-discharge is covered by the time bar. Well, it's a breach, a breach of the duty to deliver to the right person. In, about. In, indeed, but, but the authority site is, is the Alani, so that's yes. dealing with breach that is coterminous with, with discharge, rather than a, a breach that occurs after yeah. discharge. Um, Scrutton directly uh, on the point that my lords are concerned with off offers no assistance uh, it, it does offer some assistance on the question of what whatsoever means um, uh, uh, and insofar as it, it offers assistance it, it suggests that whatsoever has the uh, meaning that we contend for um, I'll come back to Scrutton if I need to by way of reply when I hear what my learned friend says uh, uh, about whatsoever but Scrum doesn't take matters any further on that. Uh, bills of lading at, at tab um, 28 does, however, um, uh, 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 and this begins at paragraph 11.195, uh, 11 where it's pointed out that it's Article 2 that brings into play, is the phrase used, the substantive rights and obligations set out in the rules. So that supports um, our construction. And, and goes on uh, over the page to say, subject to the doctrine of bailment on terms, it will not regulate rights and liabilities other than under a contract. And then at 197, 1197 rather, 
there is however a tension inherent in the concept of contract of carriage by goods by sea between the desire to limit the operation of the rules to maritime elements of carriage and the commercial reality that the actual contract uh, may cover other elements. So that, that's precisely the tension that the court is concerned with. Um, <coughs> uh, uh, and at the foot of that page, the uh, rules govern the responsibilities and liabilities, rights and immunities in relation to matters from loading until discharge of the goods. There's a practical difference between discharge and delivery, a legal concept denoting the transfer of possession. And there's a reference to the courts taking a pragmatic approach to that distinction. Uh, and then at 1198, there is little justification for extending the operation of the rules into either a period prior to loading when the goods have been received by the carrier or to a period when they've been discharged. Uh, nevertheless, it may seem as anomalous whether the carrier can rely on the provisions of Article 4 or 5 or Article 3 6, depending on whether an alleged default occurs before or after the cargo passes the ship's flange um, or rail. It has been suggested that the rules might continue to apply after delivery as an implied term, so that, that's a reference to, to Carver, and that in any event, the provisions of Article 3, Rule 6, at least <coughs> the Hague Bisbee rules, do apply to post discharge events, uh, and that's a reference to uh, Mr. Diamond. Uh, Mr. Diamond's um, article. These suggestions appear to be well-founded given the words in Article 2 in relation to. And again, in so far as the authors appear to conclude that the words appear to be well-founded, um, that's not a particularly strong endorsement of the view, and it's one that we, for the uh, reasons I've already submitted, uh, would respectfully suggest is, is wrong. Um, Mr. Diamond, in his article, only went so far as to say that um, the, the words... Um, whatsoever um, enhance uh, the Hague dispute rules uh, protection in the manner that I've already submitted. So it's there expressed as an implied term of the bailment rather than an entire implied term of the bill of lading contract, contract contained in or evidenced by Fine. the bill. Uh, and it may be easier, mayn't it, to say there's nothing inconsistent with the temporal reach of the Hague rules as contractual terms in saying that when the contract has come to an end but the ship owner is still in possession as bailee, it's implicit that the bailment shall be on those terms. Those are the terms that apply for the temporal period or with the temporal reach we've been talking about so far as contractual obligations are but in, in circumstances where, uh, take, take for a moment a case where it's only contract carriage by sea that's contemplated, in those circumstances, can it, can it be said, well, actually, what, what then happens when there's a failure to take delivery, let's say, and the owner lands ashore, is that the contractual aspect is spent. Then what is being performed by the ship owner are simply duties of the bailee. And if you look at it in that way, you're looking at the terms of the bailment, not the terms of the contract. Uh, in our submission, that, that's um, a distinction that can't, in these circumstances, with respect, be drawn, because the bailment is, by definition, a bailment on terms, which is the terms of the Bill of Lading. And if the Bill of Lading incorporates the Hague Rules, um, as I've already said, uh, and the Hague rules, sorry, the Hague Bisbee rules, and if I'm right and the Hague Bisbee rules only apply to part of the bailment, then by definition the parties, we come back to the same point, the parties have incorporated some provisions that apply to part, but part only of the bailment. Well, the, the analysis would be that the Hague rules apply to the whole of the contract, for so long as the contract subsists, in, in the example I'm, I'm giving. And then the question is, do they apply to the bailment, which is post-contract. It doesn't necessarily follow that because their temporal reach as contractual terms is coterminous with the length of the contract, that one can't imply that a subsequent bailment would be on the same terms, does it? I think my Lord said that the, the rules apply to the whole of the contract. Yes, the whole of the contractual period. The whole of the, but the deposit. But the contractual period doesn't end until delivery. The contractual period covered by the Hague rules ends on discharge. So we still, with respect, come back to the same point. Because the, the contract as a whole 
um, is the contract from when the carrier first, when the goods are first bailed to the carrier, um, i.e., he issues a bill of lading for receipt of goods, and, and when the con goods are delivered to the person ent entitled to deliver it. Which is another way of saying he's not he's not merely a bailey post discharge. He's still under the contractual obligation. Under the bill of lading contract, rather than the contract of carriage yes. as specified yes, yes. by the Hague Rules. It, it, precisely, my Lord. And, and so the, the contract, the bill of lading contract, is the contract which the carrier is alleged to be in breach of. Thank you. In fact, if we come back to 1198 of um, Akins and others, um, that final couple of sentences, it has been suggested, is making two, or is referring to, two distinct suggestions. One is that the whole package of rules applies as an implied term to the bailment. And the second one is that the Article 3, Rule 6 time bar in the Hague Visby rules applies on its own terms post discharge. I mean, those are distinct. Uh, those are distinct. The former is just Carver in implied term. Yes. The latter is the Hague Visby rules are wider because we use the word. Yes. Um, uh, paragraph 594 of, of Carver uh, on charter policies, page 496, is um, slightly more helpful in, in the other direction again, without any great analysis, in respect of loss and damage, um, so is the wording being considered? This wording appears in various places throughout the rules, including the limitation provision in 4.5. The time bar will operate when there is physical loss or damage to cargo relating to the goods, or delay uh, relating to such loss and damage, provided such loss or damage occurs during the period covered by the rules. So Carver on charter parties appears to accept that the the loss and damage needs to occur during the period covered by the rules, citing at 888 uh, Chong Yu Fai um, in the Hong Kong Court of Appeal. Uh, Although one of the authors has changed her mind about that. Except one of the authors changed her mind about that. Uh, and then similarly, uh, voyage charters, uh, uh, as, as my lords will be aware, paragraph 66, uh, 169, uh, says in terms of 490, even when delivery is affected, at the port of discharge, the rule does not deal with the period of time between discharge from the ship, uh, uh, discharge from the ship, when the absence of, in the absence of contract agreement, the carrier's obligations as governed by the Hague rules come to an end, and the time which may very well be later when the goods are finally delivered. And, and, and in our respectful submission, that also supports our construction, although again, one of the editors changed his mind um, subsequently. So, um, or hedged his bet. Or, or hedged uh, 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 And so uh, I said um, this morning um, that I'd come to the um, articles as well, including Mr. Davenport and, and Mr. Diamond. Uh, having said that and, and thought about it over the, the adjournment, I, I, I've made our submission that the, the words whatsoever simply I extend um, the provision of the time bar to cover the, the first point in the Oxfam. Um, I, I don't think I can make that any better by going to the articles th themselves, and I'll, I'll deal that by way of reply if I can. Okay, well, they're there for us to read on. Uh, my, 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 yeah. uh, and therefore, um, I just want to touch briefly uh, on the Carver implied term, and then very briefly on practicality. Uh, as I've said, the, the so-called Carver implied term is a reference to the suggestion of paragraph 935 of the fifth edition, which we've already looked at. Um, uh, and as Lord Justice Longmore said in the MSC Antibam, it may be that it's appropriate where there's no uh, agreement to the contrary to, to imply a term. Uh, but in our re respectful submission, there are two problems with this. Uh, firstly, it, it's necessary to consider whether or not the parties have made an agreement in, in relation to the period after discharge. And that's the clause 2C point that I'll come back to in just a moment. Secondly, whether it's appropriate to imply a term in any event. Uh, uh, and our submission on that is brief, but nonetheless, uh, we, we would suggest um, compelling. If the parties have chosen to make their contract um, subject to the Hague-Visby rules, as these parties have, 
And if we are right on the construction of behaviours we will, as we invite the court to conclude that we are, the parties have chosen to contract on terms that do not impose a time bar on the post-discharge period. And if the parties have so chosen, and so chosen by reference to an international convention that has the meaning we submit it does, it would not be appropriate to imply a term to the contrary, i.e. that imposes a time bar that the parties have not contracted on. There's no necessity to do so. Uh, and whichever test for implying terms, um, whether as a matter of law or as a matter of fact, is applied, um, it, it, it's um, not appropriate because um, it's not a necessary incident or definable category uh, of a definable category of contractual relationship. That's a quote from Chitty that's at paragraph 36 of our skeleton argument. It's not in the bundle because it, it's not in dispute. That is the consideration. Uh, and as I say, we're only considering an applied term if the court is with me on the construction of the Hague Visby Rules. Uh, and in those circumstances, it would not be appropriate to imply such a term, either as a matter of law or as a matter of fact. Um, put another way, it's not necessary to imply a term uh, for the rules uh, to apply to a period when the rules themselves don't apply themselves to that period. Um, if the draftsman of the rules and indeed the acts giving force uh, to the rules did not consider that they should apply to the post-discharge <coughs> period, there's no necessity to assume that the parties did uh, when they made their relationship subject to them. Well, to imply a term as a matter of law is one thing, but to imply a term as a matter of fact, presumably you need some facts. Um, one would, and the facts in this case are the parties have agreed a contract which is subject to the Hague Visby rules, which if we're right as a matter of construction, um, do not uh, uh, apply the time bar to the post-discharge um, phase. Uh, uh, and that is the fact. And in the light of those, that fact, is it appropriate to imply a term? And we, we suggest that the answer is no. Uh, put another way, is it obvious, uh, as the test is sometimes put for implying terms, that the parties intended uh, that the time bars would apply after discharge? Answer, no. In fact, obvious to the contrary, because they've made their contract subject to rules that don't apply um, after discharge. Um, uh, uh, that brings me on to Clause 2C, uh, which, again, um, I can deal with um, relatively briefly. As Lord Justice Longmore said in the MSC Amsterdam, uh, uh, an implied term can only operate if there is no agreement is made as to the um, actual period um, of the carriage. That's paragraph 23. Uh, uh, and in our submission, clause 2C, which the court has at page 162 of the bundle, clearly applies to the period after discharge. It, it says so in terms. The carrier shall in no case be responsible for loss or damage to the cargo, howsoever arising prior to loading into and after discharge from the vessel. So clause 2C is intended to govern the relationship between the parties after discharge and is intended to be a, a complete exclusion of liability. Uh, clause uh, 2C does not include a time bar, uh, but that does not alter the fact that it is a clause of the contract expressly dealing with the period after discharge. Uh, if the parties have turned their mind to that period and included a term expressly covering that period, Firstly, that is a very strong indication against implying any term, because if the parties had intended a time bar to apply, th there would have been a time bar as well as an exclusion of liability. And we've seen in, in the MSC Amsterdam a case where there is a time bar included within the, sorry, the New York Star, a case where there is a time bar included within the, the, the parties' contract. Just, just so I understand the, um, the scope of what we're supposed to be deciding, we have to decide whether light of clause 2C, it is um, possible or impossible to imply a term about the time bar applying post-discharge, but we are not concerned with the question whether, um, if there is no time bar, that clause does or doesn't give a defence to the misdelivery claim. Is that, is that right? You are not concerned with the second question, whether it, it gives a defence. Um, what you are concerned with is the, the question my Lord posed in relation to the implied term, but also the separate question of whether, insofar as the Hague rule, Hague Visby rules do apply this post discharge, this agreement disapplies 
So, so clause 2C is relevant in two respects. Firstly, to the court's consideration of whether to imply a term, and that's the, the, the point I've mentioned already. But secondly, the second ground of appeal is whether this clause in the standard form congen bill of lading disapplied the Hague, uh, stroke Hague, well, Hague Visby. As, um, as, an, as an agreement under Article 7. It, it, indeed. And, and, and that's the, the, the simple point. By uh, agreeing to a, a clause that uh, regulates the parties' relations post discharge but does not include a time bar, uh, that operates under Article 7, so as to disapply the time bar. It's permitted under Article 7. It's not contrary to Article 3, Rule 8, as the tribunal concluded it would be, because it's expressly permitted by, by Article 7. Uh, and it is a clause that governs the relationship post discharge without a time bar. Um, my Lord, I can't really put the matter any higher than that. It, it, it's neutral on the question of time bar. It doesn't actively say, and the Hague rules or Hague Visby rules time bar will not apply. But it's a complete exclusion of liability. Uh, 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 and in that respect, inconsistent with the need for a time bar. And therefore, we submit as a matter of construction. It, it does um, support the conclusion that the parties have disapplied the time bar insofar as it would otherwise apply by having a separate agreement. Can I just explore how that works? Um, suppose you're right on this appeal. Uh, the result, as you say, is that clause 2C is unaffected by Article 3A, and the ship owners can rely on it as a, as a defence to your claim. And the ship owners say, I think we don't have any, any liability at all for anything post discharge which you presumably then say, oh, well, as a matter of construction of 2C, it can't have been intended to apply to such a serious breach of obligations or something of that matter. I imagine you'd say something like that, otherwise this, this is going to be a pyrrhic victory for you in this case. But if, if, if there is room for an argument to that effect, namely that 2C doesn't, as a matter of construction, affect a breach of obligation of the kind that is complained of in this case, um, does that not then feed back into the point that you're now making, that there's nothing inconsistent in it with um, the uh, operation of the Hague Visby rules post contract? My Lord, I, I, see, post the, I, I see the point, uh, and the answer to it in our submission is as follows The carrier has contracted for what, what it no doubt believes and hopes is going to be a complete exclusion of liability. He may have made a bad bargain because that complete exclusion of liability may not, in fact, assist him. But if that's the bargain that the parties have made, um, that is a bargain that is inconsistent in our submission with the time bar uh, persisting. Well, it either is or it isn't a complete exclusion of liability. Uh, it doesn't really matter whether he thinks it is or not. Um, and if you're going to have a defence in the, if you're going to avoid this as an absolute defence to the claim, you have to say it isn't a complete exclusion of liability. Indeed, it's not an exclusion of li liability against the very claim that you're bringing. My lord, uh, as I've said, I said, can, can I have one moment to check that I'm not doing my clients a disservice? Perhaps? Yeah, my lord, uh, as I've said. The clause is in written and intended to be a complete exclusion of liability. Um, and I can't, repeating the point won't make it any better, um, my lord. The principal significance of clause 2C is, as we say, that it in fact reflects the position that exists under the rules anyway that they go to play after discharge. It counts against the implication of a term, uh, as suggested by the editor. But if the court is against me on all of those points, we still say that it demonstrates that the parties intended their relationship post-discharge to be, for good or for ill, governed by the term in Clause 2C and not by the time bar in Article 3, Rule 8. Is, is the way what you really want to say that Article 7 allows you to have a special regime post-discharge. This was the special regime they chose, and it doesn't contain a time bar. It, 
that, that's precisely the point, my lord. And it may, may or may not work. The carrier may or may not have made a good bargain, but that is the regime that the parties have evolved. Um, my lords, I've, I've significantly overshot the time I had intended to be on my feet, so I'm going to say very briefly something about anomalies uh, and then allow Maloney Friend to make his submissions. Uh, in our respectful submission, all of the, the, the fine distinctions, anomalies and practical issues that concern the judge and indeed the tribunal do not affect the conclusion that we invite the court to draw. Firstly, the fact that the court will have to consider perhaps where the discharge has or has not been completed is a point that will arise in any event if, uh, for example, the carrier uh, uh, avails himself of Article 7 um, and in, invokes other rules after discharge, the court will have to decide in those circumstances whether discharge has been completed or not. If the carrier and uh, the shipper enter into a contract that says that for example, the receiver will be responsible for discharge. The court will have to consider what exactly is encompassed within discharge. Or the shipper is responsible for loading. The court will have to consider what is or is not encompassed within loading. So these practical issues are inherent in the scheme in any event and not a reason for uh, uh, not upholding the submissions that we have made as to the interpretation of the rules. They are I think the receiver only incurs obligations, doesn't it, if it presents the bill of lading case no problem, or at least not the first problem. In which case, I should perhaps have said charter, and, and the example I had was the Jordan 2 case, which is right. in, in the bundles where the parties agree to make um, a, a agreements as to who under the charter party will carry out loading and discharge. The courts in those circumstances will have to consider what does or doesn't form part of loading and discharge. So the need to ask a, and answer that question as a matter of fact is not a reason for not accepting yeah, the question. Uh, and, and the other key point, and it's the only other one I'm going to deal with, is, is very briefly the submission that the purpose of the time bar is to allow the carrier to close his books. Uh, uh, and that uh, we, we don't disagree with it as a proposition, but it begs the question of which books. Uh, the carrier who is operating a ship uh, engaged on a voyage may incur any number of liabilities during the course of that voyage. He may incur um, a liability to the owners of another ship if there is a collision, uh, and that, that liability will be subject to a two-year limitation period. He, he may incur a liability to a salvage if there is a casualty. That liability will be subject to a two-year uh, limitation period. He may incur liabilities to his crew if one of them is injured on board, perhaps during the loading or discharging operation, and as a matter of English law, that will carry a three-year limitation. He may be one of the carriers in a chain of carriages um, and therefore um, liable to receive an indemnity claim if one of the other carriers pays a, a Hague Visby rules claim. Uh, and that indemnity claim can be bought after the one year period. So, my lords, al although there is clearly a benefit to closing his books at the end of one year, in, in reality, a carrier can only ever close his books in relation to claims relating to the contract of carriage. Uh, and on that basis, our submission is entirely consistent with that, because on our submission, the carrier can still close that particular part of his book, but he can't close the rest of his books, and, and that is no different to the position that would pertain whether I'm wrong or right. There will be other liabilities in respect of which the carrier can't close his books. Uh, and related to that, it is said that um, it, it, in my learned friend's skeleton argument and, and in, the, in the judgment, and I think the word the tribunal used was a serendipity, if the receiver chooses not to present the bill, uh, he can essentially say, well, now you've got to discharge, and delivery will take place later, and anything that happens after that won't be covered by the time bar. And it is said, why, why should the carrier in, in that context be put in the difficulty of either having to keep the cargo on board his ship or discharge and lose the benefit of his time bar? Uh, and the answer is that if he's supposed to be delivering only to the person that presents the bill of lading, and he chooses to present without the bill of lading, he chooses to put himself in that difficult position. And if he's compelled to do so, because um, there's a contractual term, as in the charter party in this case, that requires him to discharge and deliver without the bill of lading, then the reason he um, loses the benefit of the bill of lading is because he's signed up to a contract term that obliges him in certain circumstances to act in breach of the bill of lading 
contract by delivering without deduction of the bill of lading. Uh, and in those circumstances, there's nothing surprising or uncommercial about the carrier losing the benefit of the time bar. And in fact, the reality is that the party that provides the letter of indemnity loses the benefit of the time bar because they're indemnifying the carrier against the claims um, made against it. And so in, in our respectful submission, that suggestion that there's something uh, un untoward about our submission because of the way it impacts on the carrier's ability to close his books and, and have the benefit of the time bar simply takes um, the matter no further. So to conclude, um, we do submit that the wording of the rules is clear. Um, our submission as to the wording of the rules is supported by all, all of, of the decisions um, in this jurisdiction when they're correctly analysed. All of the decisions in the foreign courts, apart from the judgment of President Kirby, uh, when they're correctly analysed. Uh, it is not, in black and white terms, contradicted by any of the textbooks uh, and does not give rise to difficult practical issues other than those that are inherent in, in concepts of contract carriage by goods by sea in any event. Uh, uh, and in those circumstances, we do with respect suggest that the tribunal and, and Sir William Blair, the trial judge, uh, were wrong uh, in, in relation to both the issues of law and we invite the court to allow the appeal. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Smith. Mr. Rainey. I know there are three short questions before the court. The first question is, does Article 3, Rule 6, and our provision in the Hague's rules, apply on the true construction of the convention of which it forms a part to liability of the carrier for wrong delivery occurring after discharge? The second question is, if it does not, have the parties to this bill Applied the Bisby rules, including Article 3, Rule 6, to govern their relationship post discharge. And the third question is if either one or two is answered in the affirmative, so that Article 3, Rule 6 applies, what is the effect, if any, on that of Clause 2C? So taking the first question first and the approach to the, and the question of construction of Article 3, Rule 6, I'm going to deal with this in five sections. First of all, the court's approach to the, uh, contract, the construction exercise on this issue. Secondly, the language of the Hague-Bisbee Rules and the change to the Hague-Bisbee Rules effected in the Hague-Bisbee Rules and the text of Article 3, Rule 6, which this court is construing. Uh, third, the uh, confirmation we submit of the meaning derived from the construction of Article 3, Rule 6 of the Hague-Bisbee Rules from the Travaux Preparatoire. Fourth, uh, commentaries and textbooks and the views expressed in that. And fifth, cases relied upon by the bank, both here and abroad. If I start with uh, the question of approach, as has come up in argument this morning and this afternoon, we're construing, or the court is construing, an international convention. Therefore, before the Vienna Convention, the test was, as Lord Macmillan put it in stag line, broad principles of general acceptation. In subsequent cases, for example, Fothergill and Monarch Airlines, the court has held that those principles are broadly uh, the same as those in the Vienna Convention, whether the Vienna Convention was in force or not, because the Vienna Convention enshrines accepted principles of international law as to treaty interpretation. So uh, uh, and a good example of that was in the Ocean Victory, as my own friend mentioned, where the Vienna Convention was cited and applied by the court in construing the Limitation Convention of 1957. So the court is approaching the exercise by looking at the text in good faith, construing it in accordance with the ordinary meaning to be given to the treaty, 
looking at the words in their context and looking at the words in the light of the object and purpose. And I just want to say a, a few things about context and object and purpose, both for the Hague rules, but particularly for the change to the Hague rules, which is affected by the Visby Protocol. And as to object and purpose, the court will need to consider first, what was the object and purpose, insofar as it can be derived, uh, of the time bar provision in Article 3, Rule 6 of the original Hague rules? And secondly, what was the object and purpose of the redrafting? Visby rules, because as the court will be aware, one of the very few changes made to the Hague rules to clarify and amend the rules uh, uh, was summarised in, a, in a, literally an agenda of six items by the CMI at the Rijeka conference in 1959, which started the ball rolling for the discussions which culminated in the Visby protocol. And one of those, as we'll see, was the problem of delivery to somebody who's not entitled to deliver it and what that means. The object and purpose of the time bar provision in general terms was dealt with by Mr. Justice about Mr. Coxton as he was then in the Al Hani in the context of the Hague rules. And perhaps I can just take the court to that, which is in the authority of number 19. And this is effectively the closing of the book's point. My learned friend is right. The court needs to ask itself what book is being closed in, in relation to the whole contract of carriage or in relation to a part of the contract of carriage. And I'll come back to that when we're analysing the text and also uh, the, uh, the, the travel of the So in, in the decision in the al Hani, if I can ask the court please to turn using the page numbering in the bundle at the bottom, page 361, And Mr. Fox, the paragraphs, paragraphs 47 and 48 said this, and the Captain Gregos, albeit when considering Article 3, Rule 6 of the Bisbee Rules, with the addition of a word whatsoever, Lord Justice Bingham stressed that the words in any event, come back to that, and all liability when finding the time bar applied to theft of the cargo by the ship owner, stating that he could not see how any draftsman could use more emphatic language being even more emphatic with the language Lord Wilberforce considered all-embracing in the New York Star, and I'll come back to that when we're looking at Article 3, Rule 6. Further, the object of finality, which it has been held that Article 3, Rule 6 was intended to achieve, and the authorities referred to in paragraph 33 above, I'll come back to that, and also by Mr Justice Tomlinson in the Sophie J, would be seriously undermined if the rule did not apply to misdelivery claims. Assuming that there was no applicable contractual limitation, it seemed to follow from Mr Kenny's submission prescription period applicable to misdelivery claims uh, would vary according to the proper law of the bill of lading contract and the law of the forum, in particular whether the forum treated issues of prescription as matters for the law of the forum or the Lex Carsi. Now, that was being analysed in the context of does it apply to misdelivery on discharge or not? But the sa precisely the same consideration applies to a month's considering misdelivery by the carrier after discharge, still while he's performing the bill of lading contract meant to be. And if we go back to paragraph 33, uh, which Mr. Foxton referred to, where Mr. Foxton endorses the submission made by Mr. Phillips, it's at, at page 357, and paragraph uh, 33. Uh, second, an expansive construction of Article 3, Rule 6, was supported by the purpose of the which Mr. Phillips said was to enable the ship owner to close its books, relying on statements that effect by Lord Wilberforce in the Aries and Lord Justice Bingham in the Captain Gregos. So the object and the purpose of this time bar provision, both in the Hay rules and, as we will say, for CRI and the Hay Visby rules, was to enable the ship owner to close its books. And for that reason, it is normally given an expansive and purposive construction to allow the ship owner to close his books. And in a friend's submission, with which he was just closing a few moments ago, has the ship owner having two books. A, 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 between
been loading the discharge book, that can be closed, but another book relating to the goods and the performance of the contract, the bill of lading contract, and if there is only one contract, the table rules simply form part of that contract, upon, upon which we can't close the book. But don't different considerations apply, at least to some extent? I mean, the shipowner knows if his ship has been involved in a collision, because that can't happen without you knowing about it, or if you needed, if you needed salvage services. Um, and likewise, he knows um, if he's delivered the goods to someone who hasn't presented the bill of lading. He may not know if there is a cargo claim lurking there for damaged cargo, which um, he can't see because it's buried in the hold somewhere. And the um, best he can do is that because no notice of claim has been given, he's got a prima facie argument. Um, but he can't tell whether somebody is going to come out of the woodwork up to, up to six years later, if there's no time bar, at any, at any rate, within, within one year. Um, so he may not know that he's facing a cargo claim. Well, but, but, but Lord, then that supports the expansive construction, because the, the carrier knows uh, uh, that, as your Lordship says, something may come out of the woodwork when, when the goods finally get to the factory miles away from the port and someone opens up the crates or, or, or the, the, the container arrives at the reefer discovered it, it's all gone moldy. Uh, um, what the carrier needs is, is absolute certainty from a, a fixed point that the, that bill of lading contract is closed. Uh, and that is why, and we'll come on to that when we look at the, the, the use of the word delivery rather than discharge, that is why the point is taken from delivery, not discharge. Because he, he, he says, I now deliver the goods to you. We need to test this both in the case where there is delivery as well as misdelivery. I deliver the goods to you. I now have the certainty that knowing up one year after this point takes place, all claims whatsoever in respect of the goods will come onto the language of the Bisbee Protocol change. But the language is equally very wide in the Hague rules in any event for liability in respect of loss or damage. Uh, uh, and he will know that the book is closed. The, 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 the closing the book philosophy carries with it the idea that a short or shorter period of time is justified by difficulties otherwise in being able to investigate the facts and meet the claim properly. Yes. So having a short period after which uh, an owner is entitled to close his books is in some senses a shorthand for saying there are claims which, if he doesn't know about them and can't investigate them within a reasonably short period, he ought fairly to be able to say, well, then it's too late now because it's not fair to let me investigate. Them. Yes. And I think the point that my Lord was making is that a misdelivery claim doesn't really fall in that category because from the very moment of delivery, the ship owner will know whether he has or hasn't delivered against production of the bill of lading uh, and he's no he's not in put in, put in a prejudiced position if it's six years rather than one year so far as investigating the claim is concerned y if yes that's the relevant time bar well my Lord, but uh, and, and because as it's a strict liability obligation there's never going to be very much to investigate in the way uh, Lord, in I, contrast I, I, with a with a typical cargo claim. i take that i take that in the context of mr Libby, but what the court is is construing here is the operation of Article 3, Rule 6 in a misdelivery context. But what the court is actually construing is what does Article 3, Rule 6 mean as a time bar? Is it a freestanding time bar? I think your Lordship, my Lord Lord Justice Mayor, put it a halfway house. So that it, 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 it operates in relation to all liabilities in respect of the goods uh, which might be incurred by the carrier. And so one can't test it only by saying, well, I don't need to construe Article 3, Rule 6, as you say, because misdelivery is very obvious, and therefore you don't need to investigate anything, anything and there's no real purpose for, for uh. um, construing the rule in that way. But test the position in relation to the time bar in this way, and we'll come on to how this would be contemplated in the rules on the language of the rules. What of the situation where the goods are discharged, are held by the carrier for three days, while the receiver uh, uh, fiddles around looking for a bill of lading, uh, uh, and 
the goods are then damaged, due to want of care, in that particular time, but not yet apparent, because somebody disconnects the, the, the reefer plug, and the next morning reconnects it, but it's too late, the goods are spoiled. They won't know that uh, any more than they would know it if it happened on board the ship. In those circumstances, the closing of the books argument is equally applicable. So, so it, is your, it is your case that um, we're not here concerned with the halfway house, if one is pre-delivery, um, then all the Hague rule, Hague and Hague rule exceptions apply. So, for example, the fire exception would apply to, to a fire whilst it's in storage and so on. My Lord, we have two positions. First, we say that the time bar provision, whatever else may or may not apply, applies. Because it, it was... To, to, to all, to all, not just a misdelivery case, but to all... To all claims. To all claims. Right. And that's the language both of the Hague rules and the Hague rules. I anticipate a bit of, because there's no reason why it shouldn't apply when one considers that what the Hague rules are covering is a contract of carriage contained in a bill of lading, which is not confined to uh, from the over the ship's rail at one end, over the ship's rail at the other. And you can see that being contemplated in the rules themselves. I understand the submission. And then, then the other aspect is that the, the immunities also apply for that period or not? Uh, and the, the other aspect is that uh, on the true construction of, of the rules, the obligations and immunities also apply but pursuant to Article 7, which is important, they can be contracted out of if the carrier wishes. They may not wish. And that was the view of the tribunal. And we'll come on to a look at Article 2 and the judge that, that there's no warrant for reading care and custody when it is anticipated that the carrier will be caring and the custodian of the goods under the very same contract of carriage before and after. The rails, there's no warrant for reading the Hague or the Hague Bisbee rules as saying, oh, well, that's not care and custody because care and custody is only care and custody between the rails, which is the point being put by my Lord Lord Douglas Mayo to Ms. Smith this morning. I'm sure you'll, you'll come to it. You said it, it was the same contract of carriage. I understand it can be a single contract all the way up to delivery. But I thought there was a definition of contract of carriage, which confined it. It was the carriage bit. Well, I'll, come on, I'll come on to that when I, yes. come, when I come to the text, my lord. But I have your point, your lordship's point very, very well in mind. We it's not my point. It's sort of well, it's my, my <laughs> friend's <laughs> point. <laughs> when one looks at Article One uh, B, and we'll look at it when we look at the text, it's dealing with a bill of lading or other documents of title relating to the carriage of goods by sea. And it depends how you read oh, I see. that definition, because what, what Article 1B was principally concerned with, and it, it came up in the uh, 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 case in the Raphael arrest in the House of Lords, what happens if you have a document that's not, not a bill of lading, or not really a bill of lading, as we all know a bill of lading is? Is it another document of title similar to a bill of lading relating to the carriage of goods by sea? Straight rep to bill. Announcement bills in European examples that came up. And that was why that wording uh, uh, was included in the, in the definition to widen out the position from a bill of lading and because a bill of lading is a bill of lading for the carriage of goods by, uh, 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 in a ship by sea. And I'll come on to the text in, in, in just a moment. So um, those, are our, uh, those are our positions. You can contract out of, uh, out of the Hague rules, the Hague Bisbee rules at either end, if, if you want to. And when one looks at the language of Article 7, it doesn't say the Hague rules shall not apply. It says nothing in these rules prevents people from contracting out of, of their application. And Article 3.8. And Article 3.8. Uh, right, one has to read Article 3.8 and Article 7. And what, what really, together, what is really happening in our submission is that when people talk about the period of responsibility, you're talking about, I think it was the way Mr. McCatter put it, in the argument, 
you're talking about what you can't contract out of. So it's not departing responsibility so much as departing or unexcludable responsibility. Lord, absolutely, that's what we would say. The period, the period of the irreducible minimum, both of your obligations and of the sorts of defences you were allowed. And because the, one of the huge mischiefs that the Hay Rules cleared up was the, uh, uh, pages, literally pages, of a bill of lading exception. All of those were condensed into one simple but much shortened list, Article 4, Rule 2. And that's what you can't contract out of. So um, that's what I say is the, I've extended myself slightly from the language, I'm going to say the object and purpose. So the object and purpose is a, a, a freestanding time bar provision to allow the ship owner to close his books on the contract of carriage and his performance, misperformance of it in any respect. And it runs in respect to all liabilities, and that's what the court is really confirmed to through, both in the Hague Rules and the Hague Bisbee Rules, all liabilities uh, uh, whatsoever, Hague Bisbee, in any event, in respect of loss or damage, Hague Rules, from a set date. So from that set date, delivery, all the dates when the goods should have been delivered, one year rather than the end of that year, that's it. All claims stop. And that's what we say the object and purpose uh, 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 is uh, and was. Um, context. Dealing with is a bit of lading contract. Um, and so, a, a number of contextual matters. First of all, uh, as the tribunal stressed, every bill of lading contract for the carriage of goods by sea contemplates and requires delivery of the goods to be made by the carrier to the person presenting the bill of lading. That would have been absolutely known to the drafters of the Hague Rules of bills of, bills of lading with their that bread and butter. Secondly, discharge of goods and delivery of goods are different aspects of the performance of the bill of lading contract and may be at different stages. Thirdly, save in trades where the delivery of the cargo from the ship occurs instantaneously at the time of discharge, for example, liquid bulk cargoes at the flange, or some types of bulk cargo being delivered onto the uh, receiver's conveyor belt. Uh, both in 1922 as in 1968, uh, uh, cargoes are commonly, and now very rarely, delivered by the carrier to the receiver at the point of discharge, i.e. by discharging it into the receiver's literally awaiting hands from the net as it goes over the rail. Oh, did you say commonly or uncommonly? You said commonly. Commonly. I think, but I think you meant, I meant the opposite. I think I must have meant the opposite. So, uh, that, that, that net, net and over the rail exercise is uncommon. It was in 1924, certainly was by 1968, and as we see in the New York Star, Lord Wilberforce, when I come to it, the passage says that it's uh, really quite unusual now for goods to go straight to the sea, but they wait on, on the jetty. And your lordships, uh, or at least two of your lordships, will understand very well that, that that's how it happens. Goods wait for the receiver to come. One reason why they wait for the receiver to come is because the receiver doesn't have the bill of lading, or the receiver may be um, tardy in coming to take the goods. So therefore, the carrier has to arrange. Uh, um, something for the goods after they've got off the ship. And all of that would have been very well known to the drafters of both sets of rules. Please excuse my ignorance, but, but these bills of lading presumably go back well into the 19th century. Mm -hmm. Was the original conception of a carrier somebody who literally just discharged the goods at the ship's side and the receiver would take it there and then? Or has it always been the case? Goods uh, can wait on the key. It's, it, 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 it's a good question, but I think uh, originally the, the conception of a bill of lading issued in, in three uh, 
the originals would be that the bill, the bill of lading would go to different parties, and one would try would usually get to the court of discharge before the vessel arrives, so the receiver could present the bill of lading and, and, take, the, and take the goods. And therefore, when one thinks of my position by 1924 or 1968, the, the situation the, the, by that stage, the LOI, letter of indemnity uh, uh, mechanism, was well developed because the bill of lading just never got to court of discharge in time. So the, the vessel would arrive, out would go the cargo in, in the net or by the crane, and there'd be no one there to take it or no one there to take it against the bill of lading. Well, obvious in the 19th century how the bill of lading would get there first. Well, I was just thinking that, my lord. Uh, 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 I answered my lord, lord, Newdy's, lord Justice Newdy's question because I would imagine that, as it were, the posting of the bill of lading will be even slower <laughs> than the cargo steaming its way to Australia or, or, or to India. I wonder if it went in the custody of the vessel. It might have done, yes, my lord. Uh, uh, yep. Yeah. And then given to receive well, there's, there's, there's plenty, what... of, plenty of it to look at in terms of maritime history this evening. But I, I suspect, in answer to my Lord's question, that even in the 18th and 19th century, there would have been discharge into lighters and various other forms of discharge, which, which even then didn't involve the receiver taking direct. I mean, it might be the receiver's lighters, but the, I suspect it's, it's always been a feature that discharge is not necessarily contemporaneous with the receiver. And, and my Lord, that's, that's important in the context of drafting of the Hague Rules and Hague Bisbee Rules and the, and the use, unusually, in Article 3 Rule 6, they come up the language of, of delivery, not discharge. Uh, and my last contextual matter, which is particularly in the context of the Hague Bisbee Rules and the discussions which led to the change of Article 3 Rule 6, the problem, therefore, of wrong delivery, uh, what the CMI 1959 French said, livraison à une personne qui n'avait pas le droit à delivery to the person not having right to take it, take delivery, uh, would, would mean that in 1924, as in 1968, the problem of wrong delivery, given what we've just been discussing, would be a problem of wrong delivery occurring after discharge. It would probably very uncommonly occur on discharge. And indeed, it probably got slightly more common on discharge because of discharge of of liquid bulk cargoes through a flange, which in 1924 didn't exist. So those are the those are the contextual matters and the object and purpose which we now need to consider the language. Can I raise one more contextual Certainly. matter? I'm sorry to slow you down. Not at all. Um, I came across, because I was looking at it in relation to another case, the Law Commission report, which preceded the 1992 COGSA. Yes, ma'am. Uh, uh, which, as you know, involved wide consultation. Uh, and one of the things it said, at paragraph 2.42, is that uh, bills of lading might take up to a year to work their way through the chain. Um, it surprised me slightly when I read it, but the, the experience of those who were consulted would have been far greater than mine. But I just wonder how that then, if that is the case, that works with a one-year time bar in relation to delivery from the time the goods ought to have been delivered. Anyway, I'll leave that with you. Um, you, can, you can think about that and you may want to go and have a look at it. Yes. Um, I, I thought I should raise that because it's been in my mind. Thank you, my lord. Yes, thank you. I'll, I'll, I'll take that away. Um, so, with the paragraph 2.4.2, my lord, I think 2.42. 2.42, thank you. 2.42. Um, so that's the context and object of purpose of the Article 31 Vienna Convention approach. I'm now going to turn to the uh, language of the uh, convention and the language of the convention as amended, a further convention. And uh, I'm going to work off for the time being the text with the italicized bits in it, the italicized because everything is there in, in one place. Um, so if we work our way through, first of all, at page 456, the definitions in Article 1, uh, and these being precisely the same definitions in both sets of rules, um, I think there's, there's some 
immaterial text will change in the introduction to learning about it. Uh, carrier uh, includes the owner or charter who enters into a contract of carriage with a shipper. Uh, contract of carriage applies only to contracts of carriage covered by a bill of lading or any similar document of title insofar as such document relates to the carriage of goods by sea, including any bills of lading or any similar document as aforesaid, issued under or pursuant to a charter point. Uh, and it, when one sees how the, uh, how the Act understands that wording, one just turns back a page Section 3 of the Act, uh, the uh, draftsman has put every bill of lading or similar document of title. So we do not accept that the words, insofar as such document relates to the carriage of goods by sea, uh, uh, governs bill of, bill of lading. It doesn't need to, because a bill of lading is a contract of carriage of goods by sea. Uh, but that wording has been attached to deal with the non-bill of lading, similar bill of lading point. So we're dealing with a convention that deals with uh, two types of contracts of carriage, similar documents of title, I forget the time being, but also bills of lading. Uh, and therefore the drafters were conscious and aware in that definition, that they were uh, dealing with a known and settled form of contract going back to the 18th century, if not before, with settled and specific features. First, a contract under, under which the goods would, would be the received by the carrier from the shipper for loading, a contract where on shipment of the goods on board, the carrier issues the contract where the goods are then carried by sea to the contractual destination, a contract where the goods are then discharged from the ship, and a contract where the carrier is then obliged to deliver the goods to the receiver on production of the bill of lading, typically after discharge. And so the concept of delivery and the obligation to deliver uh, are important aspects of the bill of lading contract the tribunal, the experienced tribunal was right so to stress. Is that for the bill of lading only applies to the carriage of goods by sea then? Yes. What happens if you have a contract like one of the ones in the bundle where there's a sea leg and then a land leg? Is that, it's one contract. Does the bill of lading only cover the first part of it? Well no, you then, you then have, you then have a, a through a through bill of lading, which would uh, uh, cover the different stages. Um, but but at, at this stage, uh, I, I don't know how common through bills were in 1924, 1922, covering land carried by the bill of lading. But in our submission, the word bill of lading here being a bill of lading which is issued, uh, uh, and a bill of lading, the standard meaning of bill of lading will be a, a, a bill of lading which is issued for sea carriage. Only? Uh, well, only, but if it's issued for more than sea carriage, see Mr. Justice Devlin and Pyrrhus and Cindia, then the rules will only cover the sea uh, carriage contract, not the road contract. Right. The, so the bills of lading that are contemplated as being governed by the Hague rules include bills of lading which are not limited to carriage by sea. Yes. And the purpose of this is to limit the application of the rules to the carriage by sea aspect. Yes. And of, and of the carriage by sea aspect, as we'll see when we look at Article 3, uh, that will include uh, the carrier receiving the goods for loading on board and the carrier holding the goods after discharge, awaiting the production of the bill of lading. That's part and parcel of a sea carriage contract because it doesn't change its its nature. 
uh, and just because the goods are coming across the rail, it's no longer a contract uh, of carriage for goods by sea. The cardinal obligation uh, of the carrier under a bill of lading contract for carriage by sea is to deliver the goods uh, uh, to the receiver. That's a, a bill of lading contract for carriage by sea obligation. Well, it's the same obligation under a bill of lading contract which involves more than carriage by sea. It may be, well, yes. I was just picking up your, if I've got your submission correctly, as a matter of grammar, the words, insofar as such document relates to the carriage of goods by sea, you said didn't apply to bill of lading, but only applied to similar document of title. That, in our submission, is the force of the word such. So, how does this work if you have a through bill? Uh, I understand you say they're now being very common. If you have a through bill of lading with a sea leg followed by a land leg, it doesn't need to be by road, it could be by rail. Does the whole, I mean, the whole, the whole contract is not, is, is, is not a contract of carriage of goods by sea. It isn't, my lord, no. And that's why when we come on to Paris and Miss India, we see uh, Mr. Justice Devlin saying that it, it may, it'll only carry, it'll only, it'll only apply to so much of that contract that relates to the carriage by sea. Yeah. Uh, and I, I, when I say carriage by sea, I'm referring to it in, 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 the, in the wide sense, from receipt of the goods uh, to um, delivery. delivery. Uh, but it doesn't apply, for example, to inland transport. This, this this act is regulating, in a broad sense, sea catch. But isn't that what 1B does for a through transport bill? Well, I mean, if, 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 if 1B doesn't do that, what is it that just applies the rules to, to inland transit? Uh, well, because it's, it, 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 I, see your, I see what you ought to be saying. I, I, I would submit, because inherent in the bill of lading, as used in, in, this, in, in this terminology, and as used in section three, it's inherent that we're talking about a sea bill of lading. But, I, but if I'm if, 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 if that's right, what is it that applies the Hague rules to the sea leg of a through bill? Um, well, my lord, because. Um, That's what the sea bill of lading is. But it, it, I, I, see, I see the point against me. If your lordship is saying that one reads insofar as such document has been relating to either document, either a bill of lading or a similar document of title, uh, then I, I, I'm, I'm happy with that. In our submission, it's not, it's not how it's drafted. I'm happy with that. But relates to the carriage of goods by sea still doesn't tell you that it is only covering that part of the contract of carriage of goods by sea, which is between loading and discharge. It does or doesn't tell you it, that? It, 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 it doesn't tell you that. It's saying that this is a, a, a contract for sea carriage. But what I'm asking is, what, where, where else do we find a provision which does say that for a, th for a through bill? Well, it, which it, I think you say is, is the effect of the, of the rules. Uh, yes, as construed by... Um, just a devil in Paris and Cindy. So if we don't get it from 1B, where do we get it? Well, I, I would say it's inherent in the context of, 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 of what, what the draftsmen meant by the use of the word bill of lading. They weren't thinking about any other document other than a bill of lading for the contract of carriage of goods by sea or a similar document of title also for carriage of goods by sea. But you say, do you, that um, whether or not such document is limited to any similar document of title, uh, nevertheless, uh, either the bill of lading or the similar document of title uh, has an obligation to deliver, which relates to the carriage of goods by sea. Is yes, that, my lord. Is that where you're going with this? Yes, my lord. Because the, because, because the delivery obligation is part and parcel of, of a bill of lading, uh, um, if we're using these words, relating to the carriage of goods by sea. 
where, where, how else would one describe the delivery obligation that, 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 and where else does it spring from? It's part and parcel of the bill of lading relating to the carriage of goods by sea. Um, moving on from Article 1b. And I'm sorry, I, to say, I, I have got your submission right that the, the Hague rules were only ever intended to apply to bills of lading which uh, didn't involve any land element at all. Yes, Lord. Is that it, or is it they do apply to bills of lading, which may have a land element, but only apply in relation to the sea carriage part? You're absolutely right, my lord. I, I, I answer too quickly. Either to co contracts of carriage that only relate to sea carriage, or if it's a, a, a contract which relates to sea carriage and land carriage or road carriage, only to the sea carriage part. Well, that's what I thought you'd say, but that's. I'm still having difficulty in reconciling that with your submission as to the scope of 1b, because you say 1b isn't what... 1b what, sir? 1b isn't what gives rise to that, i.e. only applying the rules to the sea carriage bit, where it covers more than sea carriage. Well, Lord, I, I say it two ways, either because the term bill of lading means <coughs> sea carriage bill of lading, that's how it's understood, or alternatively, if I'm wrong, and insofar as it governs both the bill of lading and the other document title, then it, because it's a sea carriage bill of lading. My fault. I'm, I'm, I'm just not understanding. I'm afraid. If I think I think we'd settled on on your suggesting that the uh, Hague rules do apply to uh, bills of lading, which evidence contracts of carriage which involve more than the sea carriage, but that they only apply to the sea carriage element of it. Have I got that right? Yes, Ireland's India. Right. And your submission on Article 1B is that that's not, that's not where you find the provision which only, which in such a case applies the rules only to the sea carriage element. No, my lord. Well, I, I think it's possibly my fault. No, so, so it, 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 it does. does. It does. One B does it. And how does it do so? It, it does so because, uh, in one of two ways, either bill of lading means sea carriage bill of lading. Well, but that's, that's, not the, that's not the premise we're working on. Or, or you, you do have to use the words, in such, insofar as such document relates to the carriage of goods by sea, to qualify both bill of lading and a similar document. So, for example, if you have a bill of lading which relates to sea carriage and a, a road leg, the uh, relevant contract of carriage for the purpose of the rules is only the bill of lading insofar as it relates to the sea leg, not the, not the road leg. Yes. Well, I thought that was Mr. Smith's submission. I'm afraid it's entirely my fault. I, I thought that was Mr. Smith's submission. Well, what 1B is doing, as it were. But, but in it, terms of the contractual scope or temporal scope of the application of the rules. But it depends depends with how you're reading, in that, in that sense, the carriage of goods by sea. Are you reading it as being the carriage of goods by sea, i.e. from the rail to the rail? Or are you reading it as being a contract for the carriage of goods by sea, wide sense, i.e. not a land carriage, but sea carriage, which involves, as we'll see when we look at Article 3, at stages before the, the loading rail and after the discharge rail. I had understood my own friend's submission to be that the words carriage of goods by sea uh, uh, meant that it, it, you only apply the rules, any part of the rules, to the bill of lading contract insofar as it actually relates to that stage between the rail lying for some width on either, either end, and, and therefore not the whole contract of carriage for goods by sea, but only to that part of the contract that actually relates to the stage of sea carriage between loading and um, discharge. And we would say that's a wrong reading of this, 
because it doesn't, it, 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 there are different definitions which don't fit with that carriage of goods by sea. What this purpose, what this wording is doing, it applies to both bill of lading and similar documents. And in one sense, I don't care whether it does or whether it doesn't. It is not saying that this, these rules only apply to a bill of lading insofar as it relates to the stage between the loading rail and the discharge rail. That's what it's not saying. It's saying that it covers carriage of goods by sea all the way up to delivery. Yes. I think I understand that, but I've then not understood, but no doubt you'll tell us in a moment, what the purpose of the definition 1E is. I'm going to come back to that right away. It's the, it's the next one. Um, or if we can just pick up 1C, uh, um, only because it's relevant to an argument which we'll have tomorrow in relation to Clause 2C. Uh, and you'll see that certain types of goods are excluded from the operation of the Hague Rules, debt cargo and animals. And that's something which is raised in Clause 2C and may be relevant to how we approach Clause 2C when we get there. So Article 1E, carriage of goods covers the period from the time when the goods are loaded on to the time when they are discharged from the ship. This, in our submission, is linked to, to the, uh, the irreducible minimum of obligations, because one has to read that, Article 1E, with um, Article 3, Rule 8, but also if one jumps ahead to Article 7, Nothing herein contains should prevent a carrier or a ship from entering into any agreement, etc. That's the responsibility and liability of the carrier of the ship for loss or damage to in connection with the custody and care of handling of goods prior to the loading on and subsequent to the discharge from the ship on which the goods are carried by sea. So one has a carriage of goods being defined as this narrow. The unexcludable bit. The unexcludable bit. And then you have an extension at either end. Where you can exclude, that's your solution. Where you can exclude, yes. Uh, well, and, which, and which reflects the fact that under any contract, uh, uh, any bill of lading contract for carriage of goods by sea, there will be a, a stage, short or long, before loading, and there will be a stage, short or long, after discharge. That I understand. But clause one is heading, and I think we can take into account the heading, definitions. And, and it's it, Carriage of goods by sea is, is within, as carriage of goods is, is, is a phrase within inverted commas. Yes. And, and that phrase is not found in Article 7. No. So, so it's not being used to tell you what Article 7 is, it does. Unless I've misunderstood it, the only places that I've found carriage of goods, those words being used, are in Article 1b and Article 2. That's right, they're not found anywhere else, but, but there they're used. But if, yeah. the, if they're not being defined for those purposes, they're not being defined for any purpose. Well, it, it, it's an oddity, because what, what is then said is that in Article 1b and Article 2 is, relate, is um, carriage of goods by sea, which is not a defined term. And, in, and a carriage of goods by sea would not really be, would not really be uh, and indeed, the use of the word carriage of goods by sea is used in relating to contracts of carriage of goods by sea, both in, in the context of 1b, if, if one is read in the way we've just been discussing, and under Article 2, under, under every contract of carriage of goods by sea for the carrier. So do you say that um, carriage of goods means something different from carriage of goods by sea? Well, I, I, what, what I'm saying is that there are two concepts that the definitions are trying to grapple with. One, a contract for the carriage of goods by sea, which everybody knows, and which the rules, as we'll see, reflect, have a stage anterior to the, to the loading stage and uh, posterior to the discharge stage. And that uh, brings us on to Article 2. which is drafted in this way, is subject to the provisions of Article 6, under every contract of carriage of goods by sea, the carrier in relation to, 
And then what is done is particular cargo <coughs> operations are enumerated. And one of the issues for the court will be, are they enumerated in a fixed order that starts with loading and ends with discharge? So that custody and care in the middle is only in the middle, but not at either end. Uh, um, and the arbitrator's decision was that it didn't have to be read that way, because uh, when one considers that the uh, carrier is in, ha does have custody of the goods before they're loaded on board, and does have custody of the goods <laughs> after they've been discharged on board, Article 2 is perfectly capable of being read as applying to that custody and care. Uh, um, we say that uh, he, he's absolutely right. He, that being endorsed in some academic com commentary and also by President Kirby. But the easiest way, if it was to be said that all this is applying to is carriage of goods as defined in 1E, would have been simply to say, subject to the provisions of Article 6, uh, um, the carriage of goods shall be subject to the responsibilities and liabilities, etc., etc. That's not a, that's not what it said. What what the uh, what the draftsmen do are to set out a, a description of the various operations which a carrier might, will have to, have to be engaged with, and has done so in an economic way. After, if one wanted to take it chronologically, you'd say in relation to the custody and care, the loading, handling, stowage, carriage, custody and care on board, discharge, and further custody and care of such goods. But that would be a, a, a very unwieldy formulation. So what the draftsmen have done is to cover all the operations, the physical operations, uh, that a carrier uh, will carry out in relation to the goods, and say that, uh, uh, subject to provisions of Article 6, all of these uh, are governed by these rules. But under Article 7, you can contract out if you want to. I, I understand that. Yeah. But you said that there were two concepts. One was a contract for carriage of goods by sea, the composite frames, which are both pre-loading and post-discharge periods. Yes. What's the other concept? The other concept must be uh, uh, the carriage of goods uh, being uh, the uh, period of unreducible liability. Yeah. Uh, um, and that's between loading and discharge. That's between loading and discharge. So and my is question is, as a matter of text, yes. what is the definition in 1E used for? your submission. Because on Mr. Swift's submission, it's used to limit Article 2. And you say it's not used to limit Article 2. What is it used for? Uh, well, on, uh, in our submission, it's, it, it, but they've it, gone to the trouble of defining it in quite precise terms. Yes. Not absolutely precise terms. It could have been more precise. It could have said from crossing the ship's rail to crossing the ship's rail. But it, it's quite precise. And it's a period. What is that period, what, what does it do in the, in the rules? Well, on, the, the, the period in the rules, uh, um, although, although the term isn't used, it, it has to be applied in the context of Article 3, Rule 8, and Article 7. Yes, but as you say, it doesn't use those words. And, and as I pointed out, these are definitions of, of phrases. You would expect to find the phrase I, used. I accept that, my lord, but as, we, as we're, now, we're now going to see, as we come on to Article 3, Article 3 is dealing with aspects that are outside uh, the period from the time when the goods are loaded on to the time when they're discharged from the ship, at both ends. So the idea that Article, that, that, that the Hague rules only apply, every rule only applies between loading and discharge and says nothing about before and nothing about afterwards. In our submission, doesn't work on the face of the rules, because the rules do have provisions, as we'll see, which deal with things before and things afterwards. And allow, I mean, if the rules are only dealing with rail one to rail, rail two, then you don't need Article 7. Well, that depends, doesn't it, whether Article 7 is um, effectively saying that uh, the rules apply, but you can contract out, um, yes. or um, these rules have nothing to say about um, period outside loading to discharge, and therefore you can do what you like, as far as that's concerned. And that's the um, 
Which would really choice. be choice, isn't it? That's the choice. Yes. But the avoidance of that. If, if on, on Mr. Smith's construction, it would really be Article 7 is the avoidance of that. We're not saying anything about that. Well, I mean, I mean, the choices are it's either it's either for avoidance of that. It doesn't, it doesn't it ring fences something, it doesn't need ring fencing. Or alternative, it is saying the Hague rules cover a contract of carriage of goods by sea, uh, uh, um, in, including stages before and stages afterwards. But for those stages, you can uh, um, contract out. And that's the, the second choice, which is do you read custody and care in Article 2 as being custody and care whenever it occurs? Or only in custody and care while the goods are actually on board the ship. And that brings but, me up. But I think the answer to my question is if you're right, there's a careful definition of a period that one needs, which is not then actually used in the rules at all. My lord, that's right. Uh, my lord, if we then come on to Article 3, which I'll try to finish before we rise at 4.30. Um, Article 3 uh, sets out the core obligations. Um, Article 3.1 is an obligation which uh, arises before the carriage of goods uh, as defined in 1E. So it's a preparatory obligation for the uh, um, owner to get his ship in, in good order. difficult to square with a set of rules and obligations that are completely confined to the period of carriage. But it's not difficult to, to square with the words of Article 2 which, which say um, in relation to and that will be a, an obligation which is relevant in relation to the loading, the handling the carriage, the cargo it may happen earlier well, it, it would depend upon whether whether loading has even started or is even contemplated and the ship arrives in any seaworthy condition. The question then would be whether there's a breach of Article 3, Rule 1 there, even though the vessel is manifestly unfit to load anything, even though no uh, cargo has actually been brought down or has been contemplated. In our submission, that would be a breach of Article 3, Rule 1. Well, in the same way as presenting with, with dirty tanks? Yes. That's, be that's because uh, it is something which is in relation to the function of loading. So that, that takes a very wide meaning in relation to loading, but I can see that, Lord, yes. Well, that's, uh, that's, that's what the Sonia says in relation to dirty tanks. Yes. And my Lord, we then have Article uh, uh, 3, Rule 2, uh, which is a, a general obligation to, to keep and care. Uh, Keep a care for the goods is capable of applying in our submission any time. And then we have Article 3, Rule 3. After receiving the goods into its charge, the carrier or the master shall issue to the shipper a bill of lading showing, among other things, and, and, and then Article 3, Rule 4, such a bill of lading shall be prima facie evidence of the receipt by the carrier of the goods as therein described in accordance with paragraph 3. So here we have an obligation on the carrier which is uh, outside uh, the um, period of responsibility if I, if, I, if I use that phrase this is a shorthand uh, and which is contemplating that the carrier will receive the goods for loading but does not yet load them because uh, uh, he, he is then under an obligation if the shipper asks for it to give a received for shipment bill and Article 3, uh, Rule 7, then provides for the later situation when the goods are shipped and the uh, carrier, at the request of the shipper, uh, must then issue, if the request is a shipped bill, which then replaces the receipt for shipment bill. And so question then is, in between those stages which are contemplated of the carrier receiving the goods into his charge, before shipment, i.e. before loading, 
do the rules, unless excluded under Article 7, do the rules apply to cover that stage by having a, an obligation on the carrier to keep and care for the goods properly? So in our submission, it would. And that would be a statutory obligation, not a contractual obligation? That would be a statutory obligation, unless... W where the rules apply by statute, because at that stage there wouldn't be a bill of lading contract. Uh, yes, ma'am. But so that, that's... We're not, we're not at that stage contemplating a contract of carriage of any kind well, but contained in the bill. But my lord, uh, uh, assuming that the rules are applied uh, uh, contractually, and therefore we're not looking at any special statutory effect, do the rules on their face govern the responsibilities of the carrier after the goods have been received into his charge and before shipment? They can't contractually. If 3.3 if, if, if if three, three is is saying only at that stage will the bill of lading be issued. That can't be a contractual obligation to issue the bill at that stage. No, but, my Lord, I'm, I'm not so much talking about the obligation to issue the bill. I'm talking about what what do the rules say about the obligation on the carrier to care for the goods after they're received into his charge before he ships them on board? Because this is contemplating that there is a stage, which is dealt with because of the received shipment bill, where the carrier has received the goods into his charge, but has not yet shipped them. And in our submission, that's a, it's a good situation where, as the arbitrator said, for the rules uh, uh, applying in relation to custody and care, uh, uh, just as they would do uh, during the um, during the, the time they're actually on board. The carrier is, is, is has the goods delivered to him for and under the contract. And if then uh, uh, the custodian of the goods, then our submission, the rules would apply to that stage. Could you help me with how common this is in practice? What, what, what happens? The, the shipper turns up with the goods and, and the carrier takes custody of them and puts them in a warehouse? Uh, it's very common, my lord, particularly in containerized trades. Uh, the, the shipping, the large shipping, shipping lines and shipping owners have huge terminals and yards and goods arrive, are dropped off into the carrier's yard uh, and then uh, they are received into his charge and then they may wait some time before they're shipped. Well, at that, po that point, a, a bill of lading is issued, received for shipping and it's replaced under 3.7 with a ship bill when they're actually shipped, is that what happens? Uh, I'm not sure how, how often received for bill, uh, received for shipment bills are. Uh, um, they're dealt with in all the textbooks as being things that happen, and I'm not able to say how much in, the, in commercial frequency terms they do. But what, what I'm uh, uh, stressing here, uh, we're just about to come onto the stage after the discharge, here there is a stage contemplated under the rules where the, where the, good, where the carrier receives the goods into his charge. Uh, and the, the, the question then is, does Article uh, 3, Rule 2 apply? To that operation, uh, and uh, in our submission, our answer is yes, it does, unless excluded under Article 7. And then the next stage, my lord, is Article 3, Rule 6, which deals with the other end. Uh, and this is, come, this is dealing with the stage where um, the goods have arrived and are discharged and are awaiting uh, um, collection or, or delivery to the person entitled to them. And so we have in Article 3, Rule 6, Paragraph 1, uh, unless notice of loss or damage is given uh, um, at the port of discharge before at the time of the removal of the goods into the custody of the person, uh, then there's a, a prima facie evidence rule. Uh, at the end of Article 3, Rule 6, you have a, a, a provision also dealing with post-discharge uh, uh, obligations or facilities, carrier and receiving, uh, receiver giving all reasonable facilities to each other for inspecting and tallying the goods. And it's in, in that context that alone in, our, in a rule, because Article 3, Rule 6 uses the words delivery. And in our submission, the use of the word delivery is significant because it is dealing 
with the giving up of possession of the goods to the uh, receiver. And uh, if the rules ended neatly on discharge, then one would expect the time bar period also to run from discharge, irrespective of the prima facie provisions, because the rules come to an end on discharge, and therefore the time bar period should also run from discharge, or the time when the goods should have been discharged. But here, the draftsmen of the rules have used specifically the word delivery. I'm not quite sure why you say that's what you would expect to follow. When one's looking at a time bar, you might expect the, the, the time to start to run at a time when the claimant may reasonably be expected to know that he has a claim. Um, and, and that's why, for time bar purposes, one may be looking at delivery or when the goods ought to have been delivered. Well, it, 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 uh, I'm not quite sure, quite sure why you say one would expect the time bar to run from discharge. Because if the rules are only regulating uh, the period uh, up to discharge, uh, then rather than introduce a, a completely different concept, Delivery uh, in the context of a provision which is dealing with stages after discharge and before delivery, with the tallying and, and inspection and matters of, the, of that kind, uh, then uh, what is being contemplated here in our submission is the use of a completely different stage for the purpose of starting the time running and with a completely different effect. Because this is what, if one looks at the words, shall be just in any event the carrier and the ship shall be discharged from all liability in respect of loss or damage. Those words are uh, uh, um, very wide, and we would submit that even before the Hague's rules, but I'll come on to the Hague's rules tomorrow, even before the Hague's rules, these, th th this was a freestanding uh, uh, time bar provision to enable the ship owner to close all his books. Whether I'm right uh, on the Hague Bisbee rules applying or not, uh, as the tribunal have held, in respect of that, this provision was intended to have separate life, and the life that it was intended to have was to say that after delivery, all your all claims are gone if you don't bring your claim within a year. And that there are those two separate aspects to the point which is before the court. Either do the Hague Bisbee rules continue into the year? We say yes, unless excluded Article Seven. If they don't. Does Article 3, Rule 6 have entirely freestanding separate life as being a, a, a global uh, a time limit, extinguishing all liability uh, in any event? And in our submission, the language of Article 3, Rule 6 of the Hague Rules uh, uh, certainly has that effect. And uh, if I can just take the court to the New York Star in that connection. Is this a couple of minutes point? Or it's a couple uh, of minutes point. All right, we'll do that and then we'll conclude. So it's, a, it's a tab five. If I can turn in tab five. This is some um, general or embracing terms. Yes, in the yes. basic terms. Yep. Uh, and I, I entirely accept this is not a, a case on the Hague rules. So you don't have you don't have as it were the first question, which is uh, uh, does Article Three, Rule Six get excluded because it's all part of the package and it's in between the rails, if I can put it that way. But this is useful, and that's why it's cited in in the textbooks, uh, um, Scruton, Voyage Charters, and so on and so forth. It is useful as showing the width of the wording used, which supports the freestanding nature of the uh, book closing provision inserted in the rules. And it, this was dealing with uh, um, a theft after discharge. And as we see at the top of page 68, page 145 of the report, clause 17 mirrors the rule 6 of the Hague rules. And in our submission, the important things to get from this, in terms of construing Article 3, Rule 6, as a piece of, as a piece of drafting, is what Lord Wilberforce says about it. The reference to delivery of the goods shows clearly that the clause is directed towards the carrier's obligations as bailey of the goods. And we say that's just
just as true in Article 3, Rule 6 as it is in Clause 17. It, 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 I suppose it admits a distinction between obligations and contract and liability and tort, or liability means what it says, and, and therefore um, dropping down to F. Uh, the, the Lordship's opinion on construction and analysis Clause 17 plainly operates to exclude the consignee's claim. Now, this was an important uh, uh, part of the argument in showing that Article 3, Rule 6 applied to misdelivery at discharge. But in our submission, if one's looking at Article 3, Rule 6 in the place of the Hague Rule, with that all-encompassing language, and asks, is it intended only to cover liabilities incurred before or at discharge, or is it intended to cover all liabilities for uh, loss or damage? In our submission, it's the latter. This supports the freestanding construction of Article 3, Rule 6. And the words, in any event, in our submission are important. This is the long stop. Loss or damage is entirely general. And Article 3, Rule 6, therefore, has this general freestanding application. And when I come on tomorrow to uh, uh, the Bisbee Rules, uh, uh, then it gets even wider. But we do say that this clause is freestanding for the reasons I've said. Even if you are construing object and purpose, and this were an Alhani case where the misdelivery occurred after discharge, both in terms of object and purpose and context and language of Article 3, Rule 6, even if I'm wrong that the Hague Rules do not apply to govern the pre- and the post-stages, unless excluded by Article 7, Article 3, Rule 6 was drafted and was intended, looking at its language, to be an all-encompassing freestanding time bar. And that was, an, in our submission, that would have been an important part of the trade-off to use my Lord Lord Justice Pottlewell's words in the Lady M, between the carrying interests and the cargo interests. Because the carriers were giving up their right to clear their books with very short time limits and were giving what was then seen to be a very generous uh, uh, extension to cargo interests, waiving all the old bill of lading clauses. And the question for the court is, was it only intended to cover just liabilities between these two points? even though other liabilities could be incurred under the contract of carriage between, it, between which these two points, or in which these two points occur, or was it intended to cover all liabilities with respect to loss or damage? Uh, in our submission, it gets even clearer when one comes on to the Higgins rules. We'll do that tomorrow. Very good. Thank you very much. All right.